quindi... Ah, ora sentite? Bene, hanno aperto. Ok, allora, se vi accomodate anche di là, adesso non so se sentano il, questo microfono, forse qualcuno andrà, e iniziamo questa giornata. E vediamo se ancora qualcuno che si siede. Allora, eh, per quanto riguarda l'apertura dei lavori, innanzitutto buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere intervenuti, grazie di essere in presenza. Thank you for being here. We perfectly know that the situation for due to the pandemic is not over and now we have other difficult situations. Uh, so we are very pleased and thrilled to see that people want to meet again. I would like to thank all the people that are following us online on ISPRA YouTube channel. And I really hope that they can follow the, this meeting. And I would uh, leave the floor to the institutional greetings. Uh, the president of ISPRA should be here, but he couldn't make it for uh, institutional engagements, but he wanted to introduce this meeting that is full of things and uh, information that we want to share. So if we are ready, we can start with the president greetings. Good morning, everyone. As president of ISPRA, I have the opportunity and the privilege to introduce this event in which will be presented the operation tools and best practices for the project Life Seposso, coordinated by ISPRA and developed in collaboration with different partners and many stakeholders involved. Posidonia meadows are the forest of the Mediterranean Sea and they are essential for the balance of the marine ecosystem. Over the last 50 years, uh, scientists have warned us about their regression. In addition to natural causes uh, as pollution, illegal trawling, uh, and the construction of coastal works and infrastructures has also damaged the Poseidon forest, despite their protected habitat. As it happens for forests on land, also in the sea, it's possible to recover the damages caused to Posidonia Oceanica meadows through transplantations. Thanks to Life Seposto project, it has been possible to verify when a Posidonia transplantation is really effective and compensates the damages caused to the meadows. Uh, ISPRA has coordinated and carried out, together with the project's partners, for the first time in Italy and in the Mediterranean Sea, a national monitoring of Posidonia Oceanica transplants uh, carried out in the last 20 years. Uh, and at the same time, the national impact, e impact assessment decrees uh, concerning coastal works that have generated and will generate impact on Posidonia meadows have been analyzed uh, and they contributed to understand what has contributed or not to the effectiveness of the transplants. Uh, one of the institutional tasks of ISPRA is to provide our technical contribution in the EAA procedures. We know, therefore, how important it is that the indications given are scientifically indisputable for the benefits of the environmental protection, mitigation, and compensation of the environmental damage. Another aspect that I would like to stress is that as SNPA, we have the task of proposing and ensuring common strategies, methods, and objectives for the promotion of policies aimed to at environmental prevention, protection, and sustainability. This is a precise duty whose execution must take into account technical scientific details that become indispensable elements in the effort to achieve good environmental governance. I know that 
effective governance aimed at a wide and diverse audience will make it possible to contribute effectively to the transformational change required for the implementation of increasingly effective uh, measures uh, for the production, conservation, and restoration of this precious, precious, delicate Mediterranean habitat. This will not only contribute to the achievement of national and European targets for biodiversity and climate change, but will also favor the maintenance and sustainability of activities that are fundamental to the coastal areas of our country as fishing, tourism, and blue economy, in line with European and national environmental regulations. In conclusion, thanks to the work carried out in Life's Posto project, we know what to do to make transplants more effective and then um, what process to adopt to obtain the best results, whether they are carried out as a compensatory measure or to restore degraded grasslands. We have technical scientific indications, procedural insights in the EIA field, and innovative digital platform that projects the management of the environment towards the digital transformation, also of the public administrations. Therefore, a set of tools that today will allow us to restore and protect the Posidonia Oceanica meadows and the, in, in the best possible way. Thank you and enjoy your meeting. We would like to thank our president that I think that he best represented as sum up, sum up the project that we carried out in these, pro in these years that were quite complicated for this project. So we wanted to um, not just start telling how this project was born and the main achievements, we want to share with you one of our products that we uh, love because it has the real core of the achievements that we got and the passion of all the people that worked in it as stakeholders and partners, and many of them are here today but uh, they all couldn't make it. But we are very pleased to share with you our documentary, and then we will start uh, the, the real interventions. Uh, um, we are really sorry because we didn't introduce ourselves. I am Barbara Laporta of ISPRA. I am Tiziano Bacci, and we are the coordinator of this project. Uh, and here with us there is uh, Fabio Gallo, that is um, a worker of Linea Blue, and he will help us um, sh uh, sharing all the achievements and all the messages uh, that we want to share with you today. So if you are ready, we can start with the documentary. Thank you. <laughs> Negli ultimi 50 anni erosione costiera e cambiamenti climatici hanno fatto diminuire del 34% questa specie, la più diffusa del Mediterraneo, complice anche la mano dell'uomo, cattiva gestione della fascia costiera. Verde, vive sotto al mare. Sono degli alghi. Sono dei pesci, una ragosta con una stella marina, un cavalluccio marino, uh -huh. un riccio. E dietro che c'è? Questa verde, che cos'è? Tu lo sai? Sì, alghe. Alghe! Oceanica o qui della zona? Ma va si dà in Sicilia. Ti si riesce a vedere? Ma io non lungo la costa. Tu vedi le montagne di quella cosa, la costa, non è la costa che era viva. Sì, ma ce ne sono quante che dicono che non sono molto nella parte. Tutto Augusto era pieno di cose, il porto, le cantiere, al castello. 
c'è poi il rifugio di, di stelle marine, di piccoli pesci, la Posedonia proprio è un vivaio. L'hai vista? Sì, io ci tocco con i piedi, mia mamma gli fa schifo. A mamma gli fa schifo, lo immaginavi a te? A me mi faceva sembrare i piedi. Sebbene spesso confusa con un'alga, Posidonia oceanica è una pianta marina endemica del Mediterraneo, dove forma estese praterie, distribuendosi lungo le coste. Predilige le acque trasparenti e vive a una profondità che varia da poche decine di centimetri a circa 40 metri. Come le piante terrestri, ha radici, foglie e un fusto, chiamato rizoma. Almeno l'1% dei fondi del Mediterraneo è occupato dalle sue praterie, che producono quotidianamente circa 20 litri di ossigeno al metro quadrato, a beneficio dell'ecosistema costiero. Inoltre, l'anidride carbonica catturata e fissata dalla pianta è sottratta all'ambiente, contribuendo a mitigare i cambiamenti climatici. Come le grandi foreste sulla terra, le praterie di Posidonia Oceanica ospitano un'elevatissima biodiversità, stimata in circa il 25% delle specie marine mediterranee. Molti organismi vivono nelle diverse parti della pianta, poiché trovano nella prateria nutrimento e protezione. Grazie al denso manto costituito da lunghe foglie nastriformi, i posidonieti attenuano l'energia delle onde che si infrangono sui litorali, contribuendo a ridurre l'erosione che affligge le nostre coste. Inoltre, l'intreccio di rizomi e radici intrappola i sedimenti, stabilizzando il fondo attraverso la tipica formazione a terrazzo nota come matte. Lo stato di salute delle praterie è un ottimo indicatore della qualità dell'ambiente marino. Dove la Posidonia è in buona salute, anche il mare e i suoi ecosistemi lo sono. Purtroppo le praterie di Posidonia sono in regressione in tutto il bacino del Mediterraneo. Si stima che negli ultimi 50 anni la loro superficie sia diminuita di oltre il 30%. Le attività umane e le forme di inquinamento a esse correlate sono tra le principali minacce per questo ecosistema. Da piccolo era tutto pieno, tutto pieno di posatone. Ma ora questa posatonia scomparsa, no, non c'è più da tanto tempo. E perché qui, fino agli anni 50, ci hanno raccontato che c'era una bellissima prateria. Poi quando si è sviluppato tutto, tutto il polo petrolchimico, quindi con tutti gli scarichi a mare del, del polo, esatto, è stato distrutto tutto. Noi abbiamo calcolato un danno sulla prateria, eh, parliamo nel tratto che va da Siracusa fino ad Augusta, eh, quindi tutto la, il polo petrolchimico, di circa 2000 ettari. In termini economici è una cifra che non è manco valutabile, insomma, stiamo parlando di decine se non di centinaia di miliardi di danno che sono stati arrecati all'economia locale. Altre attività dell'uomo che possono danneggiare la prateria sono la pesca a strascico illegale e gli ancoraggi delle imbarcazioni da diporto e delle grandi navi commerciali. La, la cosa che voglio denunciare è il discorso della Posedone che viene strappata ogni giorno da tutto questo motoscafe che si angola. E sono parecchi, e sono tanti, sono tantissimi. Questa è una cosa che va denunciata. La costruzione o l'ampliamento di porti turistici e commerciali, la messa in posa di opere di difesa costiera e l'installazione di cavi di condotte sottomarine portano spesso allo sbancamento di estese porzioni di prateria. Inoltre, l'aumento della torbidità delle acque a causa della sospensione dei sedimenti generata dalle attività umane riduce l'efficacia della fotosintesi provocando danni alla pianta. Hai saputo che cosa è successo qui a Civitavecchia, alla prateria che stava alla Mattonara? No. Qui hanno ingrandito il porto e per fare questo ampliamento del porto e della Narsena è stata proprio distrutta una grandissima parte di una prateria di Posidonia che era lì. 
A causa della lenta crescita della Posidonia, le ferite inferte alla prateria possono impiegare anche un secolo per rimarginarsi. Tuttavia, alcune di queste opere devono comunque essere realizzate per motivi di imperante interesse pubblico. Molte di queste opere prevedono la valutazione di impatto ambientale. Quando le opere che vengono realizzate sono in prossimità di Posidonieti oppure li interessano direttamente e i Posidonieti sono protetti dalla rete Natura 2000, è necessario intervenire con opere di mitigazione e compensazione. Il trapianto di Posidonia è la più comune tecnica di compensazione usata in Italia nell'ambito della valutazione di impatto ambientale. A partire dagli anni 70, i biologi marini hanno cominciato a sviluppare diverse tecniche di trapianto per aiutare le praterie in sofferenza a ripristinare più velocemente il proprio manto vegetale. Anche io sono allievo di Eugenio Fresi. Era entrato in contatto già negli anni 70 con un gruppo che si chiamava i Giardinieri del Mare, un gruppo francese, e in particolare uno di questi Giardinieri del Mare si chiamava Couper e aveva ideato un metodo per vincolare i fasci di Posidonia al fondale. L'Italia è il paese del Mediterraneo che ha investito di più in ricerca e sperimentazione sui trapianti di Posidonia. Oltre a piccoli trapianti sperimentali, ne sono stati eseguiti di più estesi, sia per il recupero di praterie degradate, sia per compensare i danni causati da opere e infrastrutture costiere. Per compensare i danni causati alla prateria protetta della Mattonara a causa della creazione nel porto di Civitavecchia di una darsena per la diacente centrale Enel, fra l'agosto 2004 e il marzo 2005 è stato realizzato a Santa Marinella il trapianto di un ettaro di Posidonia. Questo rappresenta ancora oggi il più esteso e longevo trapianto del Mediterraneo. L'intervento a Santa Marinella consisteva, da prescrizione della Commissione Via, nel trapianto di 300.000 fasci di Posidonia su un'area complessiva di un ettaro. Sono stati disposti i moduli di trapianto che consistevano appunto in quelle cornici di cemento armate di rete metallica che derivavano dall'esperienza dei giardinieri del mare, poi modificata successivamente per essere meno impattante. Lo stesso metodo utilizzato a Santa Marinella è stato poi utilizzato per un altro intervento di una dimensione inferiore ma pur sempre significativa, a Ischia, dove si trattava di compensare il danno causato dallo scavo di una trincea per la posa di un gasdotto che unisce Ischia al continente, a, a Bacoli. L'autorità portuale di Piombino doveva ampliare il porto secondo il piano regolatore portuale e nel fare questo avremmo distrutto una grande porzione della prateria di Posidonia antistante l'ingresso del porto stesso. Per questa ragione nella procedura di via abbiamo proposto al Ministero dell'Ambiente di trasferire zolle di 4 metri quadrati di prateria in una zona adiacente nel Golfo di Follonica. Per cui nel 2014 sono state trasferite ben 314 zolle. È stata un'operazione molto complessa e delicata, anche perché questo non è un vero e proprio trapianto, ma è un trasferimento di porzioni di prateria che comprendevano anche la sottostante matte. Nella rada di Augusta, in località Seno di Priolo, nel 2014 è stato realizzato un trapianto per ripristinare la prateria preesistente. Utilizzando supporti in bioplastica, sono stati fissati più di 60.000 fasci fogliari prelevati da una prateria nelle vicinanze. Qui abbiamo impostato un impianto di eh, riforestazione che su circa 2 ettari di, di prateria 
che tenta di ripristinare il manto vegetale su delle aree dove prima c'era Posidone e oggi non c'è so, più. Sebbene il trapianto rappresenti una concreta possibilità per recuperare una prateria in regressione o danneggiata, il suo esito, talvolta incerto, genera accesi dibattiti nella comunità scientifica e nell'opinione pubblica. I venti di riforestazione in genere eh, presentano delle defaianze notevoli a livello mondiale. Eh, le cause dalla letteratura eh, sono dovute prevalentemente alla scelta sbagliata del sito e alla, al, al sistema di attacco della pianta al substrato. Il progetto europeo Life Se Posso, coordinato dall'ISPRA, Istituto Superiore per la Protezione e la Ricerca Ambientale, insieme ai partner e ai numerosi attori coinvolti, ha l'obiettivo di verificare l'esito dei trapianti realizzati a oggi in Italia e capire come migliorarli. Il progetto Se Posso ha verificato delle cose fondamentali. La prima, ad esempio, è se i trapianti che sono stati realizzati in passato siano stati fatti nel modo migliore sia da un punto di vista tecnico che scientifico. Abbiamo cercato dati ufficiali e pubblici dei trapianti effettuati in Italia nel passato, ma ne abbiamo trovati pochi e spesso con grande difficoltà. Così, nell'ambito del progetto, abbiamo deciso di andare a verificare direttamente in acqua le condizioni attuali di questi trapianti. Nel 2018 e nel 2019 abbiamo effettuato più di 50 immersioni con partner di progetto, abbiamo effettuato più di 500 ore di lavoro. Oggi finalmente abbiamo le informazioni per capire come sono andati effettivamente questi trapianti. A Santa Marinella, eh, ormai a distanza di 15 anni dal, dal trapianto, eh, il risultato è stato molto interessante e molto positivo nelle zone che sono sopravvissute a tutto quello che ha danneggiato l'intera prateria perché a causa delle condizioni meteo marine particolarmente intense e a causa soprattutto della pesca illegale che ha fatto danni enormi alla prateria abbiamo perso in totale circa il 60% dei moduli di trapianto il 40% restante tuttavia ha oggi densità della, della reale prateria che si è formata in queste zone a Ischia, nonostante alcune aree siano state danneggiate da mareggiate e ancoraggi, il trapianto è andato complessivamente bene. Dopo dieci anni, in una delle aree di trapianto monitorate, è stata osservata una prateria del tutto equiparabile a quella naturale circostante. Qui a Piombino, dopo cinque anni, il 25% delle zolle è andata completamente persa. Delle rimanenti, una parte è risultata ben strutturata, mentre il 50% eh, si sta piano piano integrando con l'ambiente circostante e una parte invece si sta completamente sfaldando. Però è ancora presto per dire come sia andato questo trapianto, serve ancora qualche anno di monitoraggio perché è chiaro ormai che per verificare l'efficacia di un trapianto è essenziale seguirne l'evoluzione per molto tempo. Giovani trapianti da seguire nel tempo, in questi anni ne abbiamo visti molti. All'isola d'Erba, quelli fatti a cavo e a capoliberi, All'isola del Giglio dopo il naufragio della costa Concordia. In Sicilia siamo stati a Mondello e a Siracusa. Abbiamo partecipato anche a un progetto in Sardegna che l'area marina protetta di Capo Carbonara fa per la riforestazione di una porzione di prateria di Posidonia danneggiata. È una bella sfida. I risultati ottenuti ci hanno dimostrato che è essenziale effettuare dei piccoli trapianti sperimentali come test prima di farne dei più estesi. È importante anche fare delle attente valutazioni per selezionare le tecniche più adeguate, ma anche per selezionare le aree di trapianto più adeguate, dove c'è maggiore probabilità di successo. È importante anche capire dove è meglio proprio non farne. Tutti i risultati tecnico-scientifici ottenuti e le buone pratiche realizzate nel progetto LIFE, se posso, permetteranno di pianificare e realizzare i futuri trapianti di Posidonia al meglio, in modo tale che possano essere davvero un efficace strumento di recupero per un habitat così importante. È stato fondamentale capire anche se tutti i soggetti coinvolti nella realizzazione di un'opera marino-costiera avessero delle conoscenze generali di Posidonia oceanica 
e se fossero stati informati dei trapianti richiesti per compensare il danno alle praterie e quale esito questi trapianti avessero avuto. Pochissimi degli intervistati conoscono cos'è posizione oceanica, quali sono le sue funzioni e quasi nessuno è a conoscenza del fatto che sono stati effettuati dei trapianti e qual è l'utilità di questi trapianti. L'unica eccezione sono stati i ricercatori, sono stati alcuni tecnici che lavorano per le industrie che realizzano le opere marittime e i responsabili delle amministrazioni. È importante continuare a tenere informata la popolazione anche dopo che il trapianto è stato effettuato per far capire il successo o l'eventuale insuccesso delle attività di trapianto. L'ideale è che tutti gli attori coinvolti a vario titolo nei trapianti di Posidonia possano condividere un unico strumento di lavoro. È per questo che abbiamo realizzato una piattaforma web innovativa dove centralizzare i dati delle opere che impattano sulle praterie di Posidonia, pianificare eventuali trapianti, controllare e governare tutte le fasi di lavoro nel tempo e poi rendere pubblici e accessibili i dati di monitoraggio e i risultati. E in ultimo occorreva far comprendere a tutti che rispettare le praterie di Posidonia significa salvaguardare il capitale naturale che esse rappresentano e i servizi ecosistemici che forniscono all'ambiente e all'uomo. Quando si pianifica o si progetta un'opera costiera è possibile che le praterie di Posidonia vengano danneggiate e in questo caso si andrebbero a perdere molti dei servizi essenziali che queste forniscono come la tutela della biodiversità marina o il supporto alla vita di molte specie marine fra i quali pesci che vengono pescati e che troviamo nei nostri mercati o ancora il turismo costiero o la difesa dall'erosione delle coste. Dare il giusto valore a questi servizi significa anche poter stimare il danno che viene arrecato alle praterie di Posidonia e quindi eh, poterle compensare dal punto di vista economico. Insieme ai partner abbiamo lavorato per fornire ai diversi soggetti coinvolti delle soluzioni specifiche per una gestione più sostenibile e più efficace delle praterie di Posidonia Oceanica. Le praterie di Posidonia Oceanica sono un patrimonio comune a garanzia della salute del mare e dell'uomo. Solo una costante sinergia tra ricerca scientifica, azioni di governo e partecipazione consapevole dei cittadini potrà veramente garantire la tutela e il recupero di questo habitat. È necessario che ognuno di noi se ne prenda cura. abbassare l'audio dei titoli di coda. So, after watching this video, you can perfectly understand how many people worked on this video. For the reason, first of all, we would like to thank our colleague that realized this work, Daniela Genta, who worked on the video as well, and Stefano Salvatore, our video operator that's present here with our team with Augusto he was very young in 2018 Augusto is uh, a pet we adopted we called him Augusto and thank you for bringing it here because it's a pleasure So Seposso was uh, uh, this as well, a family who saved a, a pet, a little dog. You could say that that's not necessary uh, adding something else because the video we've just watched was enough to understand the, our topic.
Quello che invece, insomma, noi ci teniamo particolarmente. But for us it's very important to say, I have already said it, but it's still important, that words are team work. And we have to thank a lot of people, a lot of colleagues, for this work we carried out together. It was a common adventure, a shared one. So first of all, I would like to thank my colleague. Yeah, of course, we worked together for years. OK, we can continue with the next slide. Is this our presentation? No, I don't want, please. Ehm, per cui insomma ovviamente i nostri saluti non saranno esaustivi of course to thank everyone we should spend a lot of time but it's a pleasure to thank at least the four months of the several sectors because they work a lot and for the reason we have a feeling of gratitude for them. Deve spingere parecchio? Non va. Vabbè, diciamo che provo un po'. Pro provo io da qui, dai che sì. sono. Ok, let me try. Thank you. So, first of all, we would like to thank our institute, Institute for the Protection and Environmental Research, ISPRA the coordinator of this project. As you can see, we work with a lot of colleagues and we would like to thank every one of them for their contribution. That's like, um, every one of them is like a, a leaf of a Posidonia uh, Oceanica plant. And every one of us built a little piece to, to, to build, to create this common project. For example, we would like to thank the management and project research activities, the co colleagues, and the um, National Center of Research, Dam Damiano Centioli, Paolo Tomassetti. And of course, we would like to thank our partners as well. For example, the partners of um, University of Rome, Tor Vergata, Michele Scardi, University of Palermo, Sabiano Calvo, National Center of Research, the Institute for Anthropic Impact and Sustainability Research in Marine Habitat, and uh, Cecilia Mancusi of Regional Agency for the Environment Protection of Tuscany, Port Authority of the North uh, Tyrrhenian Sea, Claudia Bulleri, Vesenda Enterprise of uh, Stefano Conconi, uh, techni Technical Services and Infrastructures uh, Enterprise of uh, uh, Alessandro Piazzi. Our PM, we are hoping, we, let's hope that he can uh, uh, come here because now he, he had to face uh, some problems and thank you for our monitoring team the, uh, which worked in an amazing way they supported us very uh, in a very concrete way and th thanks to them we uh, could uh, carry out uh, good projects and furthermore, we would like to thank the university, several universities that uh, collaborated uh, in this project, for example, University of Genova with uh, Paolo Vassallo, University of Rome La Sapienza with San Domenico Ardizzone, International School of Scientific Diving of Stefano Acunto, and Zoological Station in particular with Maria Cristina Buglia and Gabriele Procaccini, who are there. We won't ask you to read the uh, stakeholders who participate in this project, but this is a um, brief list of our partners. 
our stakeholders to show you that we work together. And furthermore, we would like to uh, thank in particular two people very special to me. Fabio Bertasi, Monica Targusi. Yeah, of course. They work us until 3 a.m. for Italian television. And of course, regardless, they will work the whole day. They worked uh, even until uh, 3 a.m. to support us. Alessandro Piazzi, of course, he is our project manager. It was a very good colleague, and uh, he worked with us during a particular uh, complicated uh, stage of the work. And Rossella Sisti, of communication uh, team of FISPRA, she um, worked with us uh, through several projects. So, thank you. This is our partnership. Not everyone was present here, but uh, it's just a sign. So, thank you. Now, let us speak about contents over this topic. We had to thank every col colleagues. So, thank you for your participation and your presence here. As Barbara said, the video we watched is, uh, I would say, enough to explain our intention and our feeling in connection with this project, but before starting, I would like to emphasize the supporting environmental governance. We started uh, more or less four years ago. We met in Rome, and we started uh, after several projects, and uh, we are going to keep working during this period called Afterlife. Until 2027, we would like to reach, during this period, after life period, we would like to reach new, new, new goals. Of course, we know that transplantations was uh, considered like a natural recolonization of this plant, but at the same time, we have to repeat a very important thing. The transplantation, regardless of its purpose and expected outcomes, must not be used as an alibi to encourage indiscriminate development of the coastal strip. So we have to be clear. This message has to be clear. This must not be used as an alibi. The management is our priority. So what could we do? In the last decade, we saw a lot of uh, damaged meadows due to collective interest, public uh, interest, as the video said. So we have to compensate the damage caused by Posidonia Oceanica Meadows by coastal works and infrastructure subject. So during the uh, environmental impact assessment, we spent about 10 million euros. So this is the result we achieved four years ago, but it was just a compensation of uh, uh, the damage we received. In this way, we started with the project. Yes, of course, this project uh, considered a lot of cases, a lot of researchers. We are going to tell you more about it. But we focused on several cases of, of uh, researchers. And, for example, we understood that, on average, we totally lost, it means that we lost everything, the 20 or 30 of transplanted areas. 
So these areas were completely lost. And after we have to add all the values that refer to uh, not completely lost area. So something didn't work. Of course, we can't face some natural uh, effects or natural phenomena. But we wanted to understand what didn't work in the past to fix this problem and to understand the origin of the problem. If it depended on governance or on uh, human action and so on. So we wanted to find effective tools to let transplantations be more effective. Unfortunately, we have a little delay on the response on of our slides. But what could we say? We uh, met every goals. For example, the implementation implementation of tools to improve the management of uh, Posid Posidonia Oceanica. And we uh, created guidelines, guides, technical scientific manuals, lower coding web platform, training courses, speaking about uh, uh, digital transitions as well and digital transformation. We know that Posidonia Oceanica is an endemic plant so we should manage this plant in our sea, the Mediterranean one. Furthermore, we diffused awareness and knowledge of the priority Habitat Posidonia Oceanica Meadows. This aspect could uh, uh, seem uh, obvious, but it's not so obvious. In order to have a successful Posidonia Oceanica transplantation, we should have an effective governance and effective good practices. These tools can uh, reach a good result. So today we are going to debate on this topic with Fabio. Thank you for accepting this challenge and for being here. No, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. I'm so glad to see your eyes, your passion, your feeling. Because I can see your, your emotion. And I can understand the, the journey you, you, you faced. Of course, we, during the last month we met uh, several times, and for me it's an honor to be. I'm very honored to be here to present your child. We could say it in this way: you are like the mom and the dad of this big project. And I'm very thrilled to be here to see your colleagues' faces. So what about scientific uh, uh, topic? I can notice the huge energy that exists here because I saw the page of uh, the stakeholders and uh, partners uh, you involved and I hope that they re really uh, participated in this project. Let us hope so. But now I would like to ask our speakers to come here to share with, uh, with us this very special day. At the same time, I would like to ask our uh, colleagues to connect us with our colleague from UK. Before starting, I would like to thank for his presence. I would like to thank uh, the Professor Mike Elliott from uh, University of England. Good morning, Professor. Thank you for your participation. 
Please, a question. Uh, European countries has um, have enough uh, laws and administrative bodies to successfully manage coastal and lagoon habitats for the benefit of natural and society? Hmm. Good, good morning, uh, Fabio, um, and uh, good morning, Barbara and Tiziano, um, and many, many thanks for uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm sorry I can't be there, but in these difficult days of travelling, then it uh, it, it makes it uh, more difficult as being present sort of thing. So, Fabio, to, in order to answer your question, if I just take us quickly through a few slides, and I, I gather I only have uh, seven minutes, but I'll, if I um, introduce this and try and show where Posidonia and habitat recreation fits in in the, uh, in, in the general scheme of, of European governance. Um, now, I, I should say at the outset, although um, the UK has... Under, undertaking the this, this stupid decision of Brexit, and it is a stupid decision, but we are still following many of the, uh, the, the regulations. And that. So if, if I just quickly start by emphasising um, some of the things that both Barbara and Tiziano mentioned, that things were in the video, uh, and, and indeed that uh, um, the president, uh, Stefano Laporta, uh, mentioned earlier, about the need for us to protect the natural system while at the same time ensuring the sea gives us the, um, uh, the things that we want, uh, the, the benefits that we want. And we can think about all of those activities that, that you all mentioned, you know, the fishing, the, the shipping, the tourism, uh, and so on, um, as, as being an activity which has a footprint. It covers an area. That footprint leads to a set of pressures, and indeed the loss of um, Posidonia is one of the pressures, or, or even the reduction in its health. And these pressures lead to effects which might be wider. So, for example, if we affect the um, nature of the Posidonia, then it affects the local fish populations and so on. And so we need management of all this, and this is what I, I want to focus on. Um, uh, if anyone wants these slides, uh, uh, I, I can give you them freely available uh, and indeed the, um, the, the papers that go with them. So we talk about a management response, how big our management could be. So all of our countries have signed up to what we might call governance. Governance are the policies, the politics, the legislation and the administration of the way we manage the sea. And this is your, your, your question uh, there, Fabio. And we've signed up to all of these um, principles there that show what we should do to the sea, how we should develop within it, but also how we should value it and how we should manage it. Some of you have seen this diagram before. It's been around for a while now, and it's been used quite a lot. But this shows the European marine legislation. That set of red boxes in the middle there are all European directives. And then they require a member state, such as Italy or the UK, to carry out a set of activities. And that's these, these green boxes here. When we, and we do all this within a set of global initiatives in the middle here, things that we, uh, all of our countries have signed up to, such as the UN or the International Maritime Organization, and, and so on. And we can think about this as being vertically integrated, and this is where your project comes in, going from the local, which is at this end of the structure, right to the global through the European system. But we also have to get in, uh, in mind what is called the horizontal integration, and that's all the things. Now, all of these systems around it refer to everything we do in the sea. So if you got a chance to look at this closely, you would see there is fisheries and uh, waste from pipes and recreation, nature protection, archaeology, and, and so on. So let's look at some of those just related to what you're looking at, which is nature protection and leading that into 
maritime spatial planning and, and even the marine strategy framework directive. And you see here, there's a set of directives that you are contributing to by your project. This is what you, are, you know you are leading to. Um, the uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive, the Biodiversity Strategy, and the Habitats Directives, and so on. And these are all the things that you are contributing to by having good science. And the only way we can implement this governance is by having good science. Two of the main pieces of European legislation that you're leading into are, are these. The Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is all about maintaining and protecting ecological st structure and function. And your project will contribute information to all of these 11 descriptors. And then at the same time, we want to protect the system so it will produce the ecosystem services and give us benefits. And that's what this um, Maritime Spatial Planning Directive is. Where do those directives extend to? Well, this shows where all the different European legislations go um, from these transitional waters like a lagoon or an estuary and its catchment, as you see here, all the way out to sea and out to either 200 nautical miles or the midline. So you see where we, we have all of these management actions going. And then, when, then we say, who is it that's interested in the management? Who is doing the management? Who is interested in the data from your, um, from your project? And these are the government departments that have got some linking to the marine area. Mostly, your, and these are the same in Italy as the same in the UK and, and all the other countries. We have mostly the environment department or food and, and rural affairs and fisheries department. But all these other departments here have some interest in the marine area, even as, as even the defense department, as, as we've seen recently. So we can say that there is a set of bodies that have to do something in the marine. These are the ones that mainly do the work that will need your information. The fisheries body, um, trying to look at what is the effect of fisheries if Posidonia didn't exist there, and what are the benefits to fisheries if it did exist? Um, who is doing the maritime spatial planning? What about the environmental protection agencies? Um, and the statutory nature conservation bodies. And then we have the developers. Um, and, and in fact, um, uh, um, uh, President Laborta mentioned about the importance of the uh, EIAs, the Environmental Impact Assessment, which developers have to carry out. Um, and, and the video mentioned this as well. And then we have the port authorities and regulators. So, we have lots of bodies doing this, and these are the things that, that, that we do. So, in, 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 in Fabio's question there is we've got no shortage of, of people doing this. The next thing, just very briefly, is where are we managing? We start off by managing a small area, the activity footprint. And this is the EIA that would have to be carried out. So, for example, if someone wants to build a new uh, marina on your coastline, and there's a lot of them, then they would have to do a, a, an EIA for it. But then we need to look at not only the activity footprint, but also the pressures from that, which is the mechanism of effect, and the effects themselves. But now we don't just stop at that. And this is why when you've restored an area or when you examine an area of Posidonia, you can't only think about your small area, you have to think about the larger area, the sea area, you know, the Western Mediterranean or, or the, uh, um, the Adriatic, and then we move up to uh, regional seas and, and eventually the globe. So we have to think about those. And I haven't got time to go into it, but I can send you the paper if we want to. What we're doing now is saying in order to manage a complex marine area, with its habitats, such as Posidonia, uh, and its species, and so on, 
and managing all its activities, we need a systems analysis approach. And this is what we've been working on recently and we've been, we've been publishing it. So coming back to your, your questions, uh, Fabio, we, I, I, I would say that, that we do have the sufficient laws and administrative bodies. We have lots of them, and Italy does as well as, as, as all other countries. We have lots of them. The question that you need to ask yourselves is how successful is it with them working together? And have we achieved that sustainable C? And I, I can show you many areas where we haven't yet achieved that, but projects like yours at least are giving us um, information on which to base the policy. And this science to policy interface, which we're going to hear about later today, is, is really important. So I, I, I hope that's, that's answered part of your question, but I'm sure we can come back to this, um, this later. But if I, if I stop sharing there. Grazie mille, Professor Elliot. Thank you very much, Professor Elliot. Thank you. It was very clear, even for me, that I'm not an expert, not a technician, but thank you. So now let's give the floor to Fabio Badalamenti of uh, National uh, Center of Research. A good governance, could a good governance improve the uh, public opinion? In this case, if so, uh, could we create uh, more effective transplantations? We have seen a part of what constitutes the governance in the um, Mike presentation. And Mike showed as an aspect of the governance that concern who takes the makes the decision and protecting the Posidonia, Posidonia Oceanica, on the national level, we can consider the infrastructure. And in that case, we have to decide that to compensate the damages to the meadows, we have to carry out a transplantation. Can I help you? Yes, of course. Thank you. An aspect of the governance is not only who makes the decision, but also how that decisions are then issued. And this is what we studied, and above all, how those decisions are make, made and proposed to the stakeholders and the public. And this it actually determinates if we have a good or a bad governance. A good governance has uh, characteristics and uh, here you can see the eight characteristics. And if you look at them, at the names, we have already seen them. A good governance should be consensus-oriented, participatory, equitable and inclusive, efficient, effective, um, follows a rule of law, but it doesn't concern how it concerns how the uh, decisions will be made. In the case of the environmental governance, when we talk about transplantations, we always have to consider those characteristics. But, but if we consider the Artus Convention, it um, invites the states that signed it um, access to the information, and the information concern the transplantation or uh, marine uh, work. We should always guarantee the public access to information and in the decision making, because if I decide to carry out a project, I have to consider the impacts in this way. 
and I always have to guarantee the access to the justice. And this is fundamental for a good uh, governance. What did we try to do just to answer the question that you uh, do? If you look at the four areas of uh, in which we um, we uh, worked together, we prepared some semi-structured questionnaires, and we interviewed more than 120 uh, people, and we studied if the convention was actually applied. We don't have. Um, um, a project that actually says who uh, answered the questions, but it was fundamental just to understand if the project was well issued. Uh, we used a quantitative uh, uh, method and the Q methodol methodology to understand the opinions of the stakeholders. Uh, this that you can see here is a list for all the people that are listening to us and is not here in presence. And here we can see all the stakeholders uh, uh, from the policy stakeholder and so on. 124 questions were, um, were written and we understood that there is uh, little information on the role of Posidonia Oceanica and the role that it plays. Um, the questions uh, that wanted to understand how, um, how the information that the stakeholders had on the project, we understood that the information is too little and the researchers uh, had no clue. Then we had lack of information on the transplants. Few people knew what a transplant is. And we also saw a lack of transparency of the entire decision-making process. And the whole process of the environmental impact is very uh, complex. And Mike showed us some um, pictures that are quite complicated and that make us understand that it's complicated to reach a good transplantation. As for the Arus Convention, we discovered that it's uh, never ap applied. The Q methodology allowed us to find two opinions in the stakeholders that are involved in the transplantation um, ish, um, process. And all the things that we have considered uh, up to now, we have uh, um, four steps that are fundamental. The third vision has a, a common view with the environmentalism and part participation discourse. Uh, Posidonia needs to be protected. It should not be um, in, in, um, put into the seedbed. Uh, but those are all connected to the strategies that Mike showed. Uh, then we have also other directives, uh, like for example the upper growth, uh, that tends to the development of the progress uh, and the economic and technological progress. Uh, so the step two and four are linked to the state development. Uh, and the number four is uh, a vision um, aimed to the new technologies that can allow uh, transplantation. And they are in line. Uh, with the transplantation. Who was interested uh, and the environmentalists and the scientists uh, want guarantees uh, because they agree, but they want guarantees. Uh, in conclusion, what can I say just to um, answer the question? The governance is not good and we can see many conflicts because in the uh, we can see a conflict here, and what we have understood and we want to share is to guarantee a better effectiveness on transplantation. 
and consider a communication plan since the beginning because people should be informed, uh, in particular the stakeholders and the citizens uh, that see how the transplantations are realized. They have to know who, how and why uh, um, th this transplantation is implemented. Uh, also, the local knowledge should be shared. As for the conflicts, uh, it could be possible in a country just like ours, Italy, um, a better governance that could involve the stakeholders, understand what are the conflicts, and try to solve the problems. Then uh, we would like to advise uh, better governance, just like we did in our project, to control how things are going um, during um, before and after the transplantation process. Uh, I would like to thank all my team. Uh, what Barbara was saying moved me because there were many efforts um, to reach what we have achieved. Thank you, and I really hope I answered your question. I will leave the floor to Francesco Sozzi in the um, northern um, Therene Sea. Do you need this or the mic? Do you need the mic? I have two slides. Oh, perfect. Uh, I just um, ask you, what does the um, Port Authority manage and what is the mission? Well, we are a public um, body and we want to protect the sea and all the areas that are protected by degrees and uh, we are what a town is for a bigger province. We aim to project and realize and manage all the infrastructures that are useful for life and for a development of a port. Um, we constantly um, talk with stakeholders uh, and public entities, uh, the Coastal Guard, the uh, port authorities in general, but in particular and above all, we talk to the private uh, uh, agencies, the maritime agencies, uh, and even with the uh, small restaurants that are in the on the beaches and the fishermen's uh, fishermen and. Uh, how did you start with the project of Posidonia? Well, we are still wondering this, but as Fabio was saying, we were the first thinking about this in 2012. For the port development, we adopted a new plan that had new infrastructure works, and we wanted to uh, develop the Piombino Harbor just in five years. Uh, and I'm talking about real uh, projects uh, on the territory. Two of the works that we carried out, the building uh, of, um, of new uh, structures for the sea protection, we saw that there was a conflict with the Posidiano Oceanica um, Sea with, um, and we wanted to host the Costa Concordia cruise for the wreck that uh, was in the island, and we invented a new method for the um, trans um, for the wreck that was uh, there. And the decision that we made 
was accepted and allowed us to have benefits on many aspects. First of all, the te technical and scientific topic, uh, because um, we came into contact with the best experts of Posidonia that we have here in Italy. So talking with them allowed us uh, to understand what are the mistakes that we have to avoid, uh, even if um, many times mistakes are um, useful. We had a few years of monitoring and um, um, being in this project allowed us to understand what were the benefits uh, of a good experimentation. And here, um, I would like to talk as a citizen of Piombino, and I would like to thank all the young people that were engaged in this project uh, because uh, we had good feedbacks and the project was loved. And when we went in the schools, in the squares, so we got very interesting feedback. Uh, in particular, we saw that there were tourists that um, shared their opinion on the project, and they were in the streets looking at the results that we achieved, as you can see here from the image. So from a personal point of view, I have to thank the project life. I would like to conclude because alone I couldn't have done nothing. So I want to thank the doctor, the Costalli, um, Giampiero Costalli, and uh, Bulleri, Claudia Bulleri, that is my colleague. And she had to be here, but she couldn't make it because she. Um, had some health problems, and I would like to thank her, and I would like to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Marco Marcelli, University of Tuscia. What happened in the Civita Vecchia Hub? Good morning. Can, yes, we can hear you in this way, no, just wait a moment. Okay, now you can try. Just wait a moment. Wait a moment. Um, okay, now we have the mic. Now we still can't hear you. Everything was fine with Sotsi. Okay, now, okay, now we can hear you. Can you uh, skip to the second slide? Yes. Here, here you can skip the slides. Okay, okay. I was um, an observer of the uh, expansion of the Civita Vecchia Hub. This is um, a quite ancient procedure that brought to the restoration of the hub. Alfresi didn't like talked uh, about a change of ecosystems, but we always use the word restoration, and we learned to use this term. The aim of restoration is to recover the ecological functions that Posidonia Meadow generates and that were lost because of some factors. Uh, 
like, for example, the building of the port or many other factors. Uh, just to be brief, uh, aside the um, projects that we carried out uh, and uh, the achievement uh, that were quite positive, uh, even if some way, some time we uh, didn't reach what we wanted due to climate factors. The second um, project wasn't uh, reached as we wanted, and we started in, in 2015, and the other one was of 2005, 2004, 2005, and I was there because I founded the research in building and I had the opportunity to see the evolution of all the projects that we started and we embarked on. So there were many uh, changes uh, in the um, hub port, as Francesco was saying. Um, and uh, so we had three different uh, parts on the base of the uh, plots. In the future, we will have a new. Pro we will start a new project. But what happened now? Because of uh, many factors uh, and misunderstandings, the European Community and it was f crucial, opened a new procedure, a pilot, on Civitavecchia. So Italy responded quite well. There were some works uh, that were um, implemented for the sixth surface in uh, Lazio region. And on the other part, there was another project that I am going to uh, introduce that has an ecosystemic approach for the mitigation of the results in the Civitavecchia port. Because one of the assessments that was made by the European um, entities was that the habitat 1170 was not considered. So it, we changed the plan of the of this project and here we can see the new project here you can see the uh, the map of the the um, Posedanio Oceanica stretches of the area 1170 and at the end of a long period we had new information thanks to Life Seposto project and the recovery of marine environment was crucial. And it needs 10 years to understand if it achieved the goals or not. So instead of doing um, a project um, and we want and see the results at the end of the year. Now we have the moment to modify and change all the things that are, are not properly done during the process. Here we can see the uh, the the biosenosi area, and uh, here we can see another scheme of the evaluation of the ecosystem services and pre pre preliminary project design. At that time, the calculation was not as um, accurate as now. And we forecast with the um, European Center of Climate Change that allows us to understand the impacts of the climate change on the coast, we could have the results of the project a long term, in a long term, so uh, we could have the forecast of the environment um, topic, and then we could do the right uh, assessments. On the basis of this, we did simulations uh, 
one year long and we introduce all the catastrophic events just to understand and to judge the um, the the project and on those Sir, the, those services uh, were fundamental because in this way the main goal was to assess the environmental uh, measures. This project um, have, has many stakeholders involved. You can see here all the organization, organizations that are involved and the Siposo Sea Forest too that will be introduced uh, in this this afternoon and then all the national parks uh, the Life Rock Pop and I can see here Annalisa here who worked a lot for the restoration of the, um, the biocenosis and then there are many other projects um, that are crucial. All the other organizations that are involved are, are here in the slide. And now you can see the operational model to support monitoring and analysis activities with a high resolution. The OGS was um, involved the University of Palermo, Sassari, Bologna, and University of Tusha. So we are involved, the CNRR and the University of Milan. This is not just a single body or a society that consider to restore and uh, analyze uh, the ecosystem the ecosystems but we are a group and we want to study what we have lost and at the same time analyze the 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 data we also have a fund the and the professor uh, pilardi will talk about digital twin she says that uh, we don't have to um, lose these opportunity and we have to do uh, and to study the evolution of this project so you can see here some results of this professor and the different strategies that were used uh, to transplant uh, phanerograms and the analysis of the impacts done with um, mathematical processes and, and here you have Fiumicino port. Um, okay, here. Okay, here we have the partners and the roles. Let me see if I uh, forgot some of the partners, but no, I think I mentioned them all. And here you can see some of the projects uh, and the works that we have done, I have been one of the experts that have read all the uh, data report, and uh, I would like to thank the CNRR for the engagement and for the actions that they uh, did. So what are the results. First of all, the recovery of lost ecosystem services and monitoring of environmental components. The University of Palermo will contribute to um, give better methods to understand the ecosystemic services uh, and the possibility to measure, measure the oxygen in the meadows. Uh, so a uh, science-based support for the entities uh, that will be fundamental. There is not a counteract. Uh, as I wrote the first version of this project, of the pilot proje project, my dream is to have a um, contact and to let this project uh, 
um, be effective and to reach the best uh, results. Then we have a high level of technological innovation and knowledge spillovers in terms of research. So national and international. Then the spillovers to the territory, territory so jobs, involvement of civil society, a 360 degree communication program, and the creation of a marine communication and education center dedicated to school and higher education. As there are universities there, I would like to have summer, summer schools. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I give the mic to Gigi. Thank you, Marcelli. So the remote control, uh, thank you for the remote control. So you are um, working on these projects, right? Yet, of course, uh, I would like to ask you for all those people that uh, does a transplantation. Uh, what should they involve in the project? Uh, well, we are working on this uh, transplantation project. Um, and of course, when we talk about transplantation, it's quite important to consider this partial um, scale, considering what happened, uh, what was done in Santa Marinella. And I would like to thank uh, the professor um, of the Enel here on behalf of Enel for the job that she have done. We are talking about one hectare uh, um, of seed bed that was uh, reimplanted, uh, and we are talking about um, a project that Oscar you were saying before was a eight month project uh, in which the transplantation was carried out. Then uh, the choice of the areas that had to be um, transplanted were uh, chosen in a very detailed way. And the choice is fundamental, is crucial, because the choice of the sites is crucial for the um, for achieving the, the goal. After the transplantation project and measure, the minister prescribes um, monitoring that is crucial. As for Santa Marinella transplantation, after five years of monitoring, still was monitored for a long time. And I think that is the only uh, example in the world because it was monitored for 15 years uh, and this activity was crucial and has many um, aspects to analyze. Uh, let's imagine that there are some activities that should be always organized and managed. For example, for the job that we did in Santa Marinella, there were 40 um, experts that did the immersions. And at the beginning, there was a training course for all those experts. Why? Well, because the activity of implantation in Santa Marinella in a so wide scale needed many experts. Let's imagine the experts that were employed in the preparation of the, of the cuttings. And it was fundamental and required a great engagement. As for um, an, impl an implant on a liter scale, the time that is necessary is, uh, of course, not that long, but it requires uh, high quality experts and uh, 
professionals, of course. Uh, it's very important, as I was saying before, to choose uh, properly these sites because this is crucial because it allows, uh, among the other things, to highlight the sites and the areas that can be used for the transplantation. Let's imagine that in Santa Marinella, where the transplantation activity forecasts the reimplantation on uh, um, 100 square meters, the choice of the uh, transplantation areas required a longer time. Then we chose uh, the um, areas that were considered uh, useful and, uh, and the best for the project. Uh, actually, this um, project uh, required a experiment, ex uh, exp um, an experiment uh, because we had to understand if the transplantation uh, uh, process was um, adapt for the side that we cho to, uh, chose. Uh, it should be in the interest of everyone to facilitate this uh, process uh, because the uh, because the transplantation is always needed in the damaged area. Just to reach a high quality uh, project. So that's very necessary to obtain the authorization of the government. So I would like to emphasize the importance of intensification of activities and, of course, the involvement of, diff of several and different uh, bodies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're going to give the floor to Luca Marini of uh, Regione Lazio. I would like to ask you the role of the regional authority in a project like this. Buongiorno. Good morning, everyone. The role of the Lazio region has always been complicated. Above all, because we have uh, many abilities in the different offices that we have and departments that we have. Just a moment, just a moment. Sorry, the role of uh, what happened, what happened in Civitavecchia was quite important and had many problems. And he determined um, um, a problematic situation. The Lazio region try to solve the problems for the balance that we were trying to achieve in the Posidonia Oceanica with those meadows. We created more SPCs and we announced the one that were already there. I have to uh, consider um, an important thing. These sites are and the administrations uh, are always well seen. But now things are changed. I'm talking about the Lazio region. I don't know the other regions, but I know that there are many colleagues in the other regions that work in the administration in administrative offices and departments. But today, the regions have, have a lot of experts. And I am a marine biologist. And I am an expert of the special areas of conservation. And uh, what we actually do is sign documents, and we are in chief. in understanding difficult situations that can happen. And our skills are then used for ministerial 
situation and uh, the uh, natural 2000 that is crucial. I also have to say that there is a lack of information. Once the region gave the authorization, what happened in that area is not a common information because we have to find the new information. We don't have them. Two years ago, I think, we had to reconsider all the special area of conservation in Lazio region because we didn't have information and they were um, all about Posidonia Oceanica Meadows because uh, as they were fixed initially, they were not um, no longer um, possible to manage. So we had to consider all the uh, special area of conservation and to do this we had to talk with uh, the stakeholders to ask them the information and then we could uh, understand what was done and explain our opinion. In order to do this uh, we needed to do uh, proper monitoring and uh, we uh, relied on the professor Ardizzone of the prof of the U Sapienza University of Rome and we talked about the marine ecosystems and in particular um, we talked about the meadows and we found um, proper mapping of the meadows. We can't only uh, talk about the meadows, but we have to pledge to do uh, more. And uh, our meadows are in danger because in the, f in the past there were many uh, factors, like for example the illegal fishing uh, in those areas that even if it was not illegal, was not compatible with um, with the meadows. Uh, as you well know, it's very expensive and uh, difficult to protect the, those areas. And all the information that we have um, is used for the protection of those environments. Uh, imagine that all the meadows uh, of Lazio region are considered a special area of conservation. And uh, among them, there are also uh, the barriers that, have, that we need to protect. But we have local initiatives and new projects for them. And many times we confuse them because the municipality consider them without share information. So what we actually need is uh, uh, more information from the people that carry out those kind of activities. And Seposo is very, very interesting, but we are risking to lose uh, this information. Let's imagine that another problem is that there are many departments that have uh, um, uh, that don't share their information. Sorry, sorry. If I am interrupting you, can we stop uh, him? Thank you for your intervention. Thank you, Luca Marini. At uh, this moment, no, he's not listening to us. Please. Uh,
contro i fatti, per esempio. Grazie proprio... Marini, guardi. Thank you. Uh, Marini, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we have to cut here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luca Marini. Now I give the floor to Anna Cacciuni, that's from uh, Ispra. And um, how this project can uh, be linked to what we have done and uh, the role of Meadows. First of all, I would like to uh, comment the situation of uh, management of uh, um, Posidonia Meadows. Of course, we have to conserve and to protect these uh, um, meadows from uh, anthropic activities. So when we want to realize our work or if we want to intervene to a port plan, first of all, we, would we have to protect these areas. When it's not possible, we use the EIA uh, tool to compensate the damage uh, someone produced with the restoration of uh, meadows. So this environmental impact assessment is the core of the project in connection with products and activities we produce. The examples we mentioned are examples for, for example, Piombino, Civita Vecchia, are restorations and compensations, example, after prescription. So the meeting with Barbara and Tiziano was in the framework of a uh, EIA prescription about the recovery of uh, uh, Posidonia Oceanica Meadow. We saw our electric international cable between mm, different countries and we faced the challenges and fixed the problems that we saw until now. So prescription was not directly applied and the uh, implant we worked on uh, with uh, colleagues and other collaborators was uh, a very useful project. So finally we could uh, uh, carry on out this transplantation, but due to the uh, bad knowledge of this technique, we saw a, an, an attempt that was not a successful one. So even if the area was a special area of conservation, we couldn't achieve the result we, we hoped. So I'm the responsible uh, director of uh, environmental impact assessment of VISPRA. We usually work on several activities and we work in collaboration with the national uh, organization for the impact, environmental impact assessment. So the collaboration with this project gave us the possibility to understand the number of prescriptions in connection with Posidonia Oceanica Meadows. Could we show the second slide, please? The second one, okay, thank you. So if we consider this slide, we can understand that for us it's necessary to have a simplification of environmental conditions and verification of compliance with conditions. We have to remind that um, after seeing the restrictions, what happens? First of all, um, EIA procedure closes, but a new proced procedure opens with other activities, researches, planning and verification, that's not a cheap activity, that's a very expensive one. So if we consider the action we carry all out, we focus on uh, very important reports. 
for example, legislative context information and other studies. And we, during the years with time, we uh, developed a new database called uh, IDEA. And thanks to this database and the Minister of Our Environment, we manage more than 30 different uh, uh, decrees, for example, with uh, um, gas and uh, other industrial plants and ports and so on. But we are speaking about plants that affect, in a bad way, our meadows. So we can see in these 32 degrees several bad conditions that help us to understand the uh, importance of the problem. Furthermore, we can consider some cases when we see uh, transplantations, cases we've studied in the documentation we produce, for example, Civitavecchia, Piombino, Ischia, the example we, we have heard until now. So these prescriptions have a lot of uh, technical de details or other, other measure, measures, but we can see different uh, measures and different applications that we have to consider according to the environment we are working on. So the tips and the advices we received can be always be realized. Can I help you? OK, thank you. So some results. We spoke about uh, EIA proce procedures, but in order to understand these procedures, we have to think that in Civita Vecchia, we can find four EIA procedures and two Vinca procedures. That's a specific assessment with connection of special area of conservation after we have all the uh, European infringement, environment, environmental observatory, and technical table with different authorities, for example, portal authorities and NL Enterprise. So, in the prescription, we saw 16 years of administrative procedures with 24 monitoring campaigns, and every campaign is a verification of prescription. So the economic commitment is very, very important. And the same thing we could say about Pembino. In Pembino, we see 86 prescriptions. Four of them are prescriptions linked uh, to Pos Posidonia Oceanica, and the uh, same thing we could say about Ischia. Or, for example, TAP. You know, uh, Transatlantic Pipeline. With seven prescriptions in connection with uh, Posidonia Oceanica Meadows. In this ca case, Pipeline didn't affect the Posidon Oceanica. Have you proposed already some updating measures? Of course, the assessment in this project uh, brought to new fundamental products. Let me find if I can read this information in the slides. But the products were the monitoring plan of Posidonia Oceanica and some indications to improve the realization of prescriptions in connection with Posidonia Oceanica. Thank you. Now 
we are going to give the floor to Paolo Brambilla of uh, uh, Subcommission of uh, EIA. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Qual è per chi non è del mestiere? So the question is, what's the role of submission of uh, EIE? Forse l'abbiamo persa. Can you hear us? Third so people. Sì, la sentiamo e vediamo. Yes, of course. We can see your slides and we can probably listen to you. Grazie per l'invito. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to contribute with this brief uh, presentation to integrate the content of uh, my colleague uh, Cacciuoli. So the procedures of uh, EIA we a phase during the last period in connection with uh, Posidonia Oceanica is a circular procedure. In particular, we know that this procedure starts with a part and after we have to carry on some environmental studies to analyze the impact uh, assessment on Posidonia Oceanica. After we continue with a preliminary investigation of subcommission that consider the validity of this information. This information are validated with further studies. that are uh, carried out with examination with our ISPRA col colleagues in order to understand the validity of the information. After we see a measure that approves the um, necessity of the measures or, or don't, Of course, we can see in these measures a uh, lot of conditions linked to the case we are studying. For example, we see monitoring of uh, Posidonia, recovery of the plant, or conditions like the transplantations in the framework of this work and in the intervention of recovery uh, work, it's very important to ensure this circularity because it's very important for EIA, especially when the measures are not enough or if it requires a further intervention. So characteristics of this process are three, the knowledge, evaluation, and monitoring. The second aspect, very important, is linked to condition of environment. And the goal, the unique goal of this measure is no regression we can't, we mustn't accept a regression of these environmental conditions. The importance of uh, guidelines we established and the importance of a project is represented by a new logic based not just on a tool that's important to connect the several bodies. But the very important logic is important to improve 
the um, will of proponents to carry on with this path. Of course, thanks to tools that we can provide to him. So, in this way, we can reach the goal according to which we see applicant science. I mean the construction, the proponent's construction of several papers that analyze, that um, provide an, an analysis about environmental condition through the portal of the government. We worked a lot on Posidonia, especially with our lawyer. Of course, in this slide you can see five decisions with a high degree of uh, details. And in these decisions, we can see that EIA decision is linked to the protection of Posidonia with conditions. So, transplanting is the main condition that uh, has been accepted by these measures. So, for example, we could remind the decisions we had during the last years where, for example, with no interference, we understood the importance of monitoring because in this way we understood whether if we could um, intervene with transplantation or not. And uh, the connection of uh, uh, submarine product between uh, Sardinia, Corsica, Italy was another very important goal. So, let me conclude my intervention that I called Posidone to Neptune. Why? Because this um, this god was the, um, the figure that uh, gave the name to our plant, Posidonia. And of course, I would like to emphasize the importance of a common language, because these two names um, actually are the same person. So it's very important, the collaboration. OK, thank you, thank you. Now we would like to give the floor to our colleague Valentina Menona of uh, Region Tuscany. And please use the remote control. So the role of regional authority for the management in Posidonian meadows, especially in relation with EIA procedures of the Tuscan region. Hi, good morning. My name is um, Valentina Menonna of uh, Tuscany region, and what about the role of our region? Oh, maybe the control doesn't work. Okay, thank you. We could say that uh, Tuscany region with laws of conservation and habitat and ecosystems, established a new network, ecological network, mapping the sites and the special areas, for example, special area of conservation. In uh, this context, by the number 1120, we can see a protected species that's Posidonia Oceanica. So our region want to, wants to protect 
these uh, uh, species. So there are several measures we could use to manage the Posidonia Oceanica habitat. Positiva precedente, c'è un importante sito PSIC di ultima definizione, a parte la regione toscana, che... Uh... For example, we can see in the uh, green triangle a special area of conservation that was established as a measure where we um, we banned the uh, trawling to protect Posidonia Oceanica meadows. So, in every site of N Natura 2000 network, we try to protect these species. As we said with uh, our colleague between, for example, uh, Fiore River and Incarune River. Why? Because we wanted to protect and to conserve Posidonia. So the management of Tuscany region is very important to apply the strategy and the vision we want to reach. Because in this way, we can monitor and control the condition of the waters of our region. And we can understand the condition, especially the health condition, of Posidonia Oceanica. As you can see, in 2021, we controlled the condition of Posidonia in nine stations. And of course, you can see the difference between the density and the quality as well, because when the density is low, the quality as, as well uh, differs. So we use the guidelines, and that's the Spatial Planning Unit and the Evaluation 1, the Assessment 1, because our sector works on incidence assessment and on uh, environmental assessment, especially speaking with uh, human and um, anthropological works. So this is very important for us because that's a very good contribution to uh, support the governance because our work with our studies let us support politicians' uh, decisions. For example, when they think about um, measures which measures have to accept, which have to avoid, and so on. So having a database with common measures, or for example, a common technique, to common technique, assessment technique, that can be used by every one of us is a very good approach to improve the environmental evaluation and assessment. The last intervention was on Maritime Special Planning Unit. As the first speaker uh, told us, so we would like to improve the sustainability, saving and conserving the maritime space and maritime areas in, in Italy we we have spoken a lot about the um, marine space and we of course try to fix and to solve the conflicts in the uh, maritime space 
as you can see the green color is the most important because it's uh, uh, near to Natura 2000 network uh, areas because the natural aspect is so important for our territory. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you. And now we are going to give the floor to uh, Mancusi of Arpat. It was the role of uh, regional agency and what was your contribution? Thank you. My colleague already has already explained the role because the regions aim to uh, conserve and to protect Posidonia Oceanica. And this is an object, an, an aim we can meet through the tools we have in the framework of our project. We carried out three different supports. For example, the support linked to EIA, because our sector works in a specific way on it. After we analyzed with a lot of details several procedures of EIA that during the last 10 years have faced the problem of Posidonia Oceanica and we faced uh, every impacts direct and in um, um, di direct especially direct impacts of Posidonia Oceanica but of course we had um, a few activities in connection with transplantations, for example, in Piombino. My colleague of uh, EIA sector told me that uh, proper procedures that followed every state was just a few, uh, for example, two or three sectors. So we have to uh, remind that it's very necessary to keep working on it. And another uh, very important aspect was the technical aspect. ARPAD was one of uh, the Italian agency with a mar marine sector, with uh, a coastal monitoring and a diving group, a diving team in collaboration with ISPRA and University. In this context, a lot of uh, experts, diving experts, worked in the water, in the sea, to bring information. And for the reason we could improve the uh, information and add information to what we already had. After we contributed in the communication sector, we amplified the communication that's very important in this project and the project we had. According to your opinion, do you think it would be appreciated for our past experience in life supposed to be transferred to a similar situation so that Posidonia meadows are managed in a homogeneous way through the country? Of course, I think, sir, I totally agree and this process uh, has already started. Let me say, even if uh, we are going to speak about it during this day, but we are going to work, after, especially after the um, law of 2017, with the collaboration of uh, ISPRA and other agency, we started working in a network, and this network enforce the spirit because uh, we can see a homogeneous way to face a national challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Now we would like to exit because we have uh, uh, commented 
the sea aspect and uh, Posidonia Oceanica aspect, but what could we say about uh, web platform? Can the digital transformation that our country needs also cover issues such as those we are talking about? Uh, sorry, you are, uh, of course, Stephanie Conconi of Vizenda Society Enterprise. Yeah, good morning. I am Stefano Conconi, one of a small and medium enterprise of your partnership. Of course, I would like to answer to this question. I've listened to your interventions, and I think that there are some main aspects and key points. If you want, I can help you changing the slide for you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Don't worry, because slide will be just to show you some aspects. So listening to you, I understand that Badalamenti spoke about the co governance and the complicated governance. Marini, the difficulty of uh, uh, information, to access of information, actually the importance of a database and a website. And Valentina said to us that we don't have information. It would be very useful having information of others' work. And Baci, at the very beginning, uh, Cecilia as well, told us about a tracking of this information. So these are key points regarding the uh, digital transformation we have to meet. Digital transformation doesn't mean to use a technology. We are speaking about adapting, adapting our way of working to what can we, um, to the profit we can have using these technologies, because we should be uh, we should work in a sustainable way using data as well. You emphasize this aspect. Oh, before, sorry. So in order to understand this challenge, we have to follow the innovation that are created in our country as well. Because digital transformation needs an approach to meet these goals. One of these approaches is the smart operational process management approach based on five main lines. Sustainably transform time and cost of implementation into a digitally smart process and ensure flexibility and scalability because I need to use a device that has to be flexible because we constantly see new laws, new adaptation, news. So we have to cre create a new device, a digital one. We have to ensure quality and reliability of information because if I need uh, information and I can find them, or maybe I find them but with no quality. In this case, I would find a uh, not an effective uh, uh, result. And if uh, I have already information and technologies, I have to extend them. I can't throw it out. So one fundamental point is using technology. Because SOPM is an approach enabled by innovative technologies. Low code or no code. I mean, with no code, that's very important. Because in this way, I can offer a visual approach to designing, deploying, and configuration and configuration of digital applications without writing a code, for example. 
And as we mentioned, this is um, a ledger activity. A ledger is an innovative enterprise that let us introduce these technologies in our country. In this uh, digital transformation, I would like to speak about the ledger technology because this technology was realized using these characteristics, agility and flexibility. We started in 2017, as Barbara said, trying to define, to analyze the processes and this platform let us find the information and understand them, of course, with time, procedures uh, uh, change it. And for the reason, we try to re-establish a new technique. So this platform, Posidonia web platform, gives us the possibility to find the information we need and that's what you mentioned this that's a unique platform we uh, created together to understand the environmental impact assessment to organize data documents and several stages of our work so it's, it was very important to see the main point and to have the access to this information. Following with the next slide, we can see the processes of stakeholders. Very briefly. OK, this is the light I would like to speak about. That's fine. If we read this point, we can find an answer of the difficulties we mentioned, we have mentioned this morning. For example, we have digital transformation and innovation of planning, evaluation, monitoring, and communication processes. We can see the support to define environmental condition. We can understand the assessment we, we work on. And of course, the assessment of laws because last during the last five years we saw a lot of changes changes of these laws and the flexibility the rap, the traceability as well because we would like to extend this project in an European uh, vision and for the reason we presented this work thank you could I add just one thing, yes, of course, please. Yeah, I would like to say that for life project, we worked on this project and on this pro uh, platform not just uh, to study um, Posidonia Oceanic problems, it was repeatable even for other problems, other environmental problems. So this tool is very useful not just to study Posidonia, but also for regions, for associations who are facing this uh, topic, because we have to emphasize that during this process, the environmental impact assessment process, Posidonia Oceanic was a good preparation to start this work, but the actors we have to face are a lot. Thank you, thank you for your intervention. And thank you for your interesting point of view. Yeah, yeah, thank you, because it was very useful to understand the governance and the uh, procedures in connection with governance. Thank you. Now, Fabio, we are going to speak of another topic, the natural capital and uh, ecosystematical services of Posidonia Oceanica. 
Okay, now we are going to sit together. We are going to listen to to colleagues through internet. And in the meantime, I would like to invite Fabrizio Soli. Welcome, Fabrizio. Good morning. Please, Fabrizio, if you can change your place, because we have to organize even the topic number six and five. If the speakers of five and six and six a topic uh, are listening to us, please uh, come here. Please, Tiziano, would you like to start? No, sorry. Now we are going to speak about natural capital. After we are going to connect our um, monitor to our colleagues. So, Sebastiano Calvo, Michele, please. Come here. So, speakers of the next topic and uh, of uh, topic number five and number six, please sit. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. And thank you for your patience. So, I think we are ready. Okay. Do we have the connection with Giacomo Pozzolino? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you to our technicians and uh, workers that are working hard to let us participate in this meeting with uh, uh, our colleagues. Compensatory transplantation, is it also for an economic point of view? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your question. I'll try to introduce uh, these other products uh, did by setting and in collaboration with other partners uh, of the um, natural and environment impacts. Uh, of course, it is uh, compensatory, and uh, some of the interventions uh, um, that I listened to already talked about this. Uh, and this is a tool that can support the um, that can um, support the environment impact assessment uh, on the Posidonia Oceanica studies. Uh, and it's very important to s s uh, highlight that this is a guide can, that can be used because it has crucial tools uh, that can help to estimate the economic value of the meadows uh, and also the other um, uh, assessment um, processes. Uh, I have to say that, generally speaking, it's crucial to give uh, an economic value to the environment. Uh, and in the last 20 years, uh, the natural capital has been fundamental linked to the ecosystemic, the, um, ecosystemic um, processes. Uh, and uh, we all know that in all the stages of uh, decision-making, it was crucial. Giving value to the environment is fundamental for different factors. Uh, generally speaking, we can say that this allows us, us to have uh, some information and figures uh, that can be added to the classic um, environmental figures. Uh, then is fundamental the use uh, of the economic environmental assessment uh, and the natural carbon para paradigms. Uh, in fact, the the is fundamental to consider the economic um, environmental assessment. Uh, as for the climate change. Uh, this is uh, fundamental to consider the link with the um, with the projects that we are doing to 
um, go against these uh, processes. Today, we can say that there are uh, carbon emissions that are quite dangerous, uh, and we um, studied it, uh, and we, and, uh, uh, um, in particular, when we wrote this uh, this report, uh, this report, and we will see different points of view. I uh, would like to say that, as you asked. Just uh, I just have this slide to introduce three important points for the value of the ecosystems. First of all, the precautionary principle, the conservation of biodiversity and ecosystems, and the intergenerational equity. I would like, first of all, to, con to focus on the first two points because um, um, some um, speakers uh, talked about them, in particular for the Environment Impacts Agreement topic. Uh, and um, I think that this is uh, uh, crucial. And in the uh, Block 6, uh, Piazzi, Federica Gasbarro and Carmen Malagisi will focus on this topic. Uh, the transplantation of Poseidonia Oceanica contribute to the last part uh, that uh, we can find in the mitigation hierarchy of the environment impacts uh, because we have methods and approach approaches appro an approach that is fundamental to face uh, the economic waste um, of the Poseidonia oceanica um, transplantations uh, in order to understand uh, um, what are the um, processes and what is uh, crucial to do. It would be a, a complete compensatory process and uh, the economic aspect is crucial here. So there are topics that could support the choice of the different kinds of transplantations and the different plants. And uh, considering the capital in this ecosystemic um, process is uh, quite useful. And it represents uh, the environmental tools and means to assess the the costs and the effects and the impacts concerning what uh, the Poseidonia Oceanica project uh, uh, want to achieve and also the costs that the Poseidonia Oceanica transplants uh, need. Here we are. Thank you, Cozzolino. There was um, there is a delay. I don't know if you were looking for another slide, but thank you, thank thank you. We also have uh, Vassallo from University of Genoa. Welcome. What is natural capital, and how is it valued? Yes, hello. Well, first of all, thank you for your invitation. I'm, I, uh, I, am, I couldn't be there because I am locked in my house and I can't exit. Thank you for your question because it gives me the opportunity to talk about the activities uh, that here with my research group carry uh, I, we carry out and that there are also included in the guide that um, uh, Giacomo um, explained. Before starting with the details, um, I think that is fundamental to explain what is uh, natural capital for us. When we talk about um, natural capital, 
we can say that we have uh, many different um, definitions. Uh, we usually um, decide to use uh, the one that you can see here. We can say that natural capital is uh, the stock of natural resources, including geology, that are fundamental for the ecosystem and that can but can give services to um, the human being. From an ecologic point of view, it's quite clear. So we are at ease when we talk about it, but we have to consider that when we talk about an assessment of this capital, we have some problems because the assessment can be done in different ways and because there are classic definitions that are that doesn't and that don't work properly to define what the capital natural capital is we need um, some factors that help us to give the right importance to this factor. We have been studied a lot, nearly 30 years uh, that we have been studying on this topic and what we can say is that um, there are some uh, biophysic assessment that are crucial and those are assessments that consider the cost of the pr uh, production of that good, uh, how much um, we spend for the construction of um, a service or a good for, um, for the human being. So when I introduce this theory, there is always much there is confusion, uh, and I know because when we talk about cost and value, there is uh, um, a different interpretation. But actually, even in the uh, economic theory, um, it's difficult to understand it. Uh, so I would like to give you an example. Recently, I've been uh, watching with my sons um, a TV program, and we were watching uh, this series, and the main character is um, a scientific researcher that faced life with a scientific uh, point of view. And he was helping the girl creating some stuff that were necessary for for um, for her and she asks him uh, the um, the cost the value of the stuff that uh, she was creating and this man this young boy here said uh, well he started to calculate the cost of the production. So he said you have to consider the electricity, the glue, the time that you spend on it, uh, and the website and that you will use to sell this product. So the final result is not fundamental, but the gist is that the cost, the value, was not um, profitable. And this is actually how we value, uh, how we estimate the, the value and the cost. Um, so the same thing is the same concept that we have to give to the uh, natural capital as a, as a cost. The natural capital is a cost function. And how can we consider uh, this cost? It's it's difficult to say, but we have a natural process that you can see here, and we have to uh, jump hop on a machine time just to understand what's the right thing to do. Briefly, 
in a part of the process of coming back in time, we had to understand the ecosystem functions that were uh, carried down in the past, the time uh, in that passed, and uh, even the resources that you can find here on the bottom and that were used in the generation of the natural capital. The resources are a lot and different among them, and this is why we need a last passage that allows us to understand all the resources and uh, that can help us to add all the uh, resources together. And this last passage is fundamental. And what we have proposed uh, is this uh, uh, technique, Emergy Analysis, that was uh, uh, introduced uh, in 1996 by Odium. And this analysis makes us uh, calculate the cost and the function. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention and for the time that you gave me. Enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Vassallo. I'll give the floor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Fabrizio Azzori, Director um, of Capo Carbonara, a special area of conservation. Welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. I would like to thank Barbara and Tiziana uh, and Tiziano for your wonderful job and engagement and for all the example that you gave us and also for as a partner of the projects and the first transplantation that happened in Europe and you were there and we saw wonderful achievement so these um, uh, this this was fundamental for us because we had the opportunity to start new transplantations and have many uh, new donations uh, and from brands that are investing on the concept of transplantation to reach uh, recovery of um, a determinate uh, site that is full of um, natural capital. So this value of uh, natural uh, value is uh, fundamental. Also economically speaking, uh, and um, just a part of um, this process must be considered uh, in the economic part. So the euros uh, and the money that it can get and uh, that will determine uh, positive consequences. We all, we all live in this earth and it's composed um, and, uh, by the sea and uh, a good and healthy environment can give uh, wonderful um, benefits for the human being. And the environment is uh, fundamental because, for example, we used to go on holidays where the places are um, uh, clean and where there is a special protection for the environment. And uh, from here, there is the idea of conservation. This is why we all try to conserve, to conserve the environment. Uh, I know that um, and I would like to tell you that we uh, really hope to keep on with this uh, protection and all the, uh, the job that you are doing, uh, all the little actions that you are making are fundamental for the future. In, um, in um, our case, Villa Simius, this is what emerged from the study of University of Genoa in 2016. 
um, on the value of the natural capital. In green here, you can see the biocenosis that are the 23% of the total marine ex ex um, extension. This is the map of the natural capital. So um, how much in euros is the uh, Poseidonia Oceanica meadows to be protected? So the value goes from uh, Two per uh, two percent and uh, four point twenty nine in each square meter. We can find here a lot of um, processes that we have carried out, and the value that you can see here uh, should always be be this and the ninety two percent of the benthic biomass is made by uh, is uh, on sand uh, bed the importance that Poseidonia has uh, in this kind of site is uh, um, quite important as you can see in the graph so the Poseidonia Oceanica is uh, crucial for the maintenance of an ecosystem um, from here we can see many uh, um, consequences like for example the stocking uh, and the carbon print and uh, all the benefits uh, and it's fundamental of the transplantation uh, transplantation uh, um, actions that allow us to have uh, a better natural uh, carbon and this is why we invest on future as for the future, Barbara, we entered the future. I don't know if you have, if you um, have seen, but here we have new kids entering the room. So an applause to all these kids. Oh, you are a lot. Thank you. So. Uh, this is part of the program and this is an invasion but we are so happy to see these kids because here we have kids that will give us the so-called good practices and what are those good practices well these kids when we were here talking about uh, this the this topic they were upstairs and they were uh, doing many activities to understand this topic because these kids here uh, that come from two different schools uh, Padre Semeria uh, school and uh, the school from Piemonte Largo Guzzadi no they know many things about this topic and they uh, did um, a workshop on Poseidonia Oceanica and they un understood the importance uh, and the beauty of this uh, Poseidonia Oceanica. Maybe they already saw Poseidonia Oceanica in the meadows, but they have been asked and explained the damage that uh, the uh, pre um, the meadows uh, have to um, experience. So we ask them to give us uh, instructions, um, good practices, let's say, that it can seem uh, a word that we, the adult, use, but actually it's used by kids too. So in these... Uh, um, in this audience of next generation, is there someone that wants to give us these good practices? Those are documents that we want to give them, but is there someone that wants to give us the good practices that you wrote? Be fearless. We won't bite you. Okay, here here it goes. Uh, an applause for this girl. Yeah. 
Piacere. Welcome. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Beatrice. Welcome, Beatrice. Where are you from? Where do you study? Ah, in Principe di Monte School. The fourth year. And what about you? Fourth B of Principe di Monte School. After another class, 4D of Principe di Monte School. Come here, please, sit. Have a seat. Thank you. Okay, here we are. Hi, who are you? Okay, this is yours. This is yours. What's your name? Mattia. Where do you study? In Nobuzano School for D. Would you like to read your best practices? Do you have a micro? Okay, here we are. Ladies first, please, Beatrice, read your good practice, your message. Please do not destroy Posidonia. Let us protect it. It's so clear. Thank you, but according, please say the truth. Have you ever had a doubt? You know, the substrate of the sea. Do you like uh, uh, sea whips? Well, actually, I don't like sea. I don't like uh, sea whips, but this is not uh, a sea whip. Now, I actually love Posidonia Oceanica. Where do you study? In Principe Bellomonte School. So, for you, for your class. Okay, here we are. Four boxes. One for you, one for your class, for your contribution. Please, an applause. Thank you, Beatrice. Because children have to be soldier to, de to defend, to protect Posidonia Oceanica meadows. Please, next one. Just a moment. Please. We have to define protected areas. We have to recycling. And we don't have to throw garbage away, especially in the sea. Our colleague is very glad to hear your intervention. Please, could you repeat where do you study? I'm Anita. I study in Principe di Felomonte School. And now it's Flavio Stern. Just a moment, Flavio. Okay, we are ready. Start. Do not pollute. Do respect Posidonia Oceanica and just speak about it. Wow. Of course, that's very important. That's a good idea, isn't it? Flavio, please. This is for your teacher and for your class. Thank you, Barbara. Next one. Your name, Mattia. What do you study? Largo di Lino Buzzati School. We have to conserve the area, the habitat. We do not, uh, please do not uh, fish with a uh, ban technique, for example, the trolling. And this is for you, thank you. Okay, we are going to follow your indication, your advices. We are going to publish them on our website. Yeah, very good idea, the review one. Very interesting, very important. Thank you. Another applause for these children. Thank you. Now you can go back to your to well with your friends thank you thank you thank you guys
coro da stadio. E soprattutto eh, raccontate a casa quello che avete imparato oggi, così. And please do tell what you learned today with your parents, with your family. Passiamo all'altro tema, quindi, Fabio. Cosa? Passiamo all'altro tema, Fabio. Non non ti ho sentito dire. Passiamo all'altro tema. Sì, assolutamente. Okay, so now let's speak about the second, the next topic. Posidonia Oceanica transplantations, good practices that we can repeat in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. Let's show our presentation, our slides. Of course, they are, everyone of them is a uh, uh, Flavius fan. Tasto indietro per andare avanti. Tasto in giù per andare avanti. Tasto in giù per andare avanti. Okay, use the control, the remote control to manage your presentation. Here we are. Please, Tiziano Bacci. Che cosa ha fatto, no? Okay, what we can see. What's the action of our project? We said before that the project controlled the transplantations and transplant transplanting activities in Italy. First thing we notice in a review, in a monitoring activity in the Mediterranean Sea, is that Italy invested more than other countries, speaking about transplantations. So, of course, the transplantations activity is linked to recovery uh, action. And in this picture, you can notice that other countries worked as well on transplantations, for example, French, Spain, but Italy invested more than others. And it was very necessary to compensate the damage caused um, on Posidonia. For example, the transplantation we had during the last years that was supported by the government and by um, Ministry of uh, Environment. So, this uh, fact can uh, allow us to understand the data we have. And the next slide is very interesting because in this picture we can notice the transplantations of our project, what we controlled. Of course, we have already spoken about the first four cases of transplantation. For example, of Santa Marinella, Piombino, we have uh, uh, spoke about this morning, the Ischia one, the Priolo one. The last one was in the framework of uh, research. I mean, mm, not to compensate our uh, natural damage. But after we keep, we we kept um, studying on this monitoring activity to understand the last twenty year action and the condition of the plant. We studied the damages of Santa Marinella and more recent uh, damages. For example, we saw that the most part of, uh, almost the 50% of the transplantations were um, replied to natural damages. After in Sicily, with red color, we saw experimental trans transplants after in uh, green color, for example, in Tuscany and other region, we saw transplants for restoring of degraded meadows. And this initiative supported the activity, especially uh, the activity of conservation of the natural habitat. And after or the experimental transplants to discover new techniques. 
and the viability of uh, some project, like an experimental project to start new ones after. Gigi said it, the importance of the experimental project, uh, important for the um, planning of uh, our projects and for the, manage the management of it. The next, in the next slide, we can uh, analyze the technique we used. We have different uh, uh, type of techniques with uh, um, te interventions on uh, salmon material, on stones, on mate, and uh, of course, these interventions have different age. So we can compare these uh, different projects, but they help help us to understand the potentiality and the good and the bad point, pros and cons pros and, and uh, cons of uh, our projects. And especially we gathered the main uh, techniques we use in the Mediterranean Sea, for example in Italy, to protect Posidonia Oceanica. These are uh, made in Italy patents because we invented them and we keep using them. For example, we see on the left cement frameworks and grids, or for example, stakes that we started using in uh, the 80s. After we used from the 20s, uh, we use uh, germans, plates, stars. Stars are a particular device that we are going to explain after. Another experiment was with plates because we shifted plates. That's the only one case in Italy, and uh, there are three more in the Mediterranean Sea. After we showed uh, cages with stones with the last technologies that. Um, helped us understand that Posidonia can grow can grow even in stones or other material. So we are uh, researching to understand and to find out which materials uh, can fit. So after working on this project, we discovered a lot of partners that have been working with us during the last 20 or 30 years, and we worked with all the stakeholders, even if they were not part of the project at first, at the very beginning. So in this way, we wrote a handbook of this project, the Technique and Operative Procedures Handbook, especially this focused on the uh, transplants of Posidonia Oceanica. In this handbook, we can find some advices, very clear but very important, with interesting aspects in connection with uh, transplants and application of these techniques, and information about substrate and so on. The handbook has three sections. The first one is dedicated to transplants, and for every technique, we have several paragraphs that, in a different way, describe, for example, story of technique, the, descri the brief description of technique, the anchoring substrate of our technique, because they were uh, created with different perspectives, and uh, we can find in the same handbook, in the same section, a list of different cases of study that uh, were used in Italy, especially in Italy. So we provided information about when uh, this technique was created, when was used, and so on. 
that's very important, the time, indication about time of these projects. Because, of course, the most important uh, case of study is, the most important is um, the time in connection with this, and the information we have in connection with this um, intervention. So this table s sums up the information we have. After we have another section, the spontaneous colonization of Posidona meadows in consolidated substrates. And we discovered that uh, uh, this plant can grow even uh, among stones. This information Mm, Let us discover more techniques for the transplants of uh, uh, Posidonia oceanica. And after the third section, we see Posidonia seeds and sprouts in transplanting activities. Because we see that there is a very huge debate in the Mediterranean area about this topic, so we dedicated one section to focus seeds and sprawl of uh, uh, Posidonia for transplantation, transplant, transplanting uh, activities. Tiziano, sorry. This is what we call uh, the first step but before this handbook, what did you, what have you done? Yes, of course, we have to acknowledge that at first we wrote a handbook of uh, ISPRA, and uh, in that handbook we focused several bodies of, uh, I mean, Italian bodies of the project. In this framework, we built the first project of uh, partnership and after in order to add information to this first handbook we decide to write something else something more including uh, cases of studies and other information to support the good practices so your Final step is the first, is the other's first step, right? Yes, of course, we have to keep working on it because the um, we have already published the handbook online and uh, uh, as soon as possible we will publish the English version as well. And sorry, Barbara, what do we have to consider among the classical steps? For example, a transplant step and so on. So, what do we have to consider for the management of uh, this technique? Yes, of course, we have two handbooks. Why? Because uh, could we have the presentation we were seeing, we were watching before? Avanti. Perfetto, no? Questo era lo schema che abbiamo proiettato sin dall'inizio. Un successo di un tre. This is the scheme we showed before. So we understood that um, to reach a successful transplantation of Posidonia oceanica we need an effective governance and an effective good practice. And effective good practices, of course. And we explain that we published a um, handbook with the uh, different techniques. This was explained by Tiziano. However, we know that choosing the right technique is a fundamental factor in order to create success, successful transplantation. But that's not enough, because we understood that the governance exists, that we have to support and we have to mention all the aspects. That's a complicated system. I, I, sh mm, 
I would like to use the word complex, um, difficult, because could be scary, but I simply would like to say that we have to find an easy way to reach our goal in a proper way. So that's very important to monitoring, to support, uh, to uh, control the transplantation activities. It refers to um, legislative framework, as Mike Elliott explained, speaking about the laws, the requests, the members, the countries, um, members of uh, the EU, the citizens' role, and so on. So, in part, we have already listened to the mm, to the needs. We have to follow to continue our activity. But furthermore, we have uh, uh, written in this book a procedural scheme. Why? Because it's very important to plan following uh, different rules and we have to, for example, understand the procedural, um, the procedural way of working for positonotianic transplantation to plan transplantation, to see the characterization, the assessment of the donor seagrass, the characterization of, and assessment of the recipient site the evaluation, the selection of transplantation technique, and of course, the most important is the monitoring of transplantation. Michele Scatti will explain it, because he will explain that after five years, we can understand some things. After 10 years, we can perfectly understand if the transplantation was a um, success, successful one. And furthermore, we have to manage and to protect this uh, meadow. We can't simply leave it. Otherwise, there is a very important risk to lose our uh, tools. So you asked, before you asked, uh, why are you doing these things? So another important, another important uh, um, topic to develop is the receiver of this technique. Well, I would say that that it works for everything and for everyone. We could use it to avoid, for example, the trolling, uh, or to avoid all the natural uh, damages, natural impacts, or anchoring impacts, or, for example, we could simply help um, a suffering uh, matters to recovery. So our handbook is um, direct directed to stakeholders, and it's very important to understand why do we have to start this procedure? Where do we have to start it? How can we manage the transplantations? Or um, it's even for association and organization, for example, ARP, ARPAT or stakeholders that have to share some monitoring activities to share the procedures. So, We achieved a very important goal, including ARPA's activities with uh, other stakeholders' activity, because it's very important, the communication. Stefano Canconi has already spoke about it, and we are going to speak the, about the importance of a data. And his data is very important. This data is very important for the workers on this project because it's a, a very, a, a really important tool to plan the activities of the future. So now, 
I would like to give the floor to my colleague. It, is it what? Was it clear? Yeah, of course. Now, Professor Calvo of the University of Palermo, how can we understand and what are the criteria to select potentially suitable areas to receive and support a Posidonia transplantation intervention? Yes, thank you. I think that uh, the main important we listened uh, was in the video we watched at the very beginning. So how can we understand the criteria? We can understand the importance uh, through the light, through the water. It means that with transparent uh, um, waters, we can go down until 50, 40 or 50 meters. Another very important aspect is that plants can grow in a lot of materials, in sand, stones, uh, in mud mortar as well. You know the structure which uh, died for anthropic reasons, for example, for a natural impact. So in these cases, our meadows can uh, grow again. So what can we understand from this concept? The plants can grow everything, but we perfectly understand if we visit a beach or the sea that that's not true. Because in some areas, there is no plant. There is no posidonotenica. So we discover an, a new need to understand the uh, criterion in order to find a new place that can host the transplantations of this plant. And of course, during the last 10 and 15 years, we discovered a lot of new information and we understood the main causes of a bad results of transplantations because uh, sorry could we continue with the slide with the next one yeah of course I was saying that uh, there was a failure in uh, uh, transplantations during the last years and what's the criterion of uh, this failure of course it depends on uh, it could depend on uh, the um, on not the right uh, place or for example um, bad systems of anchoring for the transplant so with our university in Palermo in 2008 we started working trying to adapt in uh, the Mediterranean area an index and this index was adapted because it was uh, taken from another area. So in the next slide, we can understand that we choose some uh, environmental information that were available when we started working. And every index has a value. A preliminary index for the transplant, we understand how to find uh, areas which uh, fit an area that uh, didn't fit. So in this case, we can analyze data and the value because otherwise, without this information, I could make a mistake. With this approach, in 2008, we created a plant in Palermo. This plant was a 20 square meters uh, in, uh, plant, and we obtained a good result. After 
twelve years, we found a meadow. A meadow, and speaking about size, was a, a, a really great result. Because structurally, was the same that the um, meadow we found uh, close to it. So we can discover that our transplantation can be compared with a natural one. For the reason we started working on this project to, to uh, carry out an implementation of these indexes. And this is what we did with Life Seposso. Nowadays, we are using modern, um, modern technologies. So, of course, we use other techniques to uh, evaluate the um, quality of the water. For example, now we use a, a satellite to to understand the parameter parameters of uh, our quality standards. And that's very important because through these parameters can give us value that can be analyzed, uh, analyzed to understand the, uh, if the quality, if the, um, if the area fits. So in this slide, you can see a new index that compare several data and that insert the information in this platform, the platform mentioned by one of the speaker, the web platform, that can be shared with every stakeholder. You can see on the right the information we can uh, take from the data we share we can see different colors. For example, on the left, you can see red uh, areas and uh, green uh, areas according to the quality and to the availability of the area to be transplanted. And next slide, please. And this was the path. The path we worked on because you can see several stages. The first one was the preliminary index. And what can you see? The Palermo Gulf. In red, we have mm, not usable areas. After we, uh, we show in this slide the possibility to extend the resources we already have, you can see that with five uh, five plants, four didn't work. One of them worked. So what did we understand? That in this area, the territory was usable to create new transplants. And nowadays, we are working. We are uh, transplanted uh, one thousand square kilometers so 1000 uh, square meters thank you thank you now we are going to give the floor to professor scardi of university of rome tor vergata so professor scardi please i would like to understand how long should the transplant transplant monitoring last and how to understand when it starts to be redundant. Oh, thank you, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, I can't be present, but of course I would like to uh, greet every one of you and to thank you. Okay, let us reply. Of course, I could say that if we want to save money, we need at least five years to understand the direction of the transplantation, and we need 10 years to understand if we met the goal we decide. 
but we can understand better my um, my advice, my consideration, following some slides I have already prepared. Let me share my screen. Okay, here we are. We can see them. Okay, we are going to skip the first slide because we have already spoken about it. But I would like to speak about transplanting, transplanting unity that can be different, that can be used through devices or through plates. That's not a real transplantation, but that's a technique we have. What is the main aim we have? I chose the main cases I, I studied, but that's true for every technique, every transplant, transplanting technique. In order to understand our activity, when, ye, when we found an area that a um, human artificial one, we have to find a way to create a natural area. So the question is how many uh, bundles we created to reach a natural habitat. That's a necessary condition for the successful uh, transplantation. So let us understand how can we decide the right number of bundles and new bundles. So let us see this technique. It could be a star technique or a cage, a metal cage technique or a plate tectonics technique. We use this uh, cutting device that's what we called uh, a bundle. After creating this uh, scheme, we have already finished our work. But what happened? A part uh, in bud transplantations, only a part of the bunches keeps living after the transplantation for several reasons. And we have to consider it. So that's what that's what happened uh, usually, and that's what happened usually during the first year. After we can consider all the aspects, for example, the trolling that has a very bad impact on Posidon Oceanica. That's illegal, in a, an illegal uh, fishing. So we have to say that this uh, trolling can remove part, a very big part of our work. It happened, it uh, keeps happening, so we have to find um, effective measures to avoid this trolling. What else do we have to do? Of course, we have to avoid the anchoring action because that's another source of impact for the natural uh, matter and for artificial one as well. At least, and we have to remind that the action of C Um, the action of the sea can ha have a um, bad impact on the sand, on the substrate, and this could cause other problems to our plantations, to natural and to um, human plantations. So what's happening? These events keep uh, occurring. 
with time and our transplantation multiplies the new bundle. And you can see that uh, the rhizomes divide and uh, they created new bundles. In an area when new bundles grow, there is the C action, yes, of course, but that's not uh, the worst impact because we have already consolidated this plant and transplantation. So, of course, anchoring action um, of the uh, ris risky technique and uh, trolling as well is very bad. So, what could we say to conclude this intervention? When we will have an, a big quantity of transplantations that can be compared with natural um, metal, the transplanting uh, units are lost in, with time. And the most interesting thing is that Plagiotropic growth keeps with an horizontal spread of transplanted grassland. So this is the dynamics we have to rebuild. Let us let us uh, start with a low number of bundles. After we can see an increase and uh, a rise of. Uh, uh, of the number, an increase of uh, number of, of bundles, and after, if we are lucky, after several years, maybe 10 or 12 years, we can reach the density of a natural matter. But in long term periods, we could colonize a very large area. So that's the main point, the profit that we are not going to see, but our children will see these results. The case I would like to present is the Ischia case in 2009, that now is a 13-year-old uh, meadow. And we, in this case, reached the density of a natural meadow, speaking about a size, for example, of leaves and so on we reached a good coverage of the colonized area. And, uh, sorry, let me speak just about uh, plate and plate transplantation. Because we have to see this topic in a different way. We can't simply count bundle, transplant, um, transplanted bundle. We have to consider the density and the propagation in the margin area of the plate. And we have to measure the size of the leaf to understand um, the probability of dying of the same plant. So in the, the picture, you can uh, see the different condition of the plate. And you can see that the density is not likely to reach the natural one. To conclude my intervention, to, to answer to the first question, the increase in the number of bundles over cuttings implanted measures is the most important thing. And it's important to understand the information in connection with uh, environmental condition. So only monitoring of the neighboring natural uh, matters allows contextualization of the results. So when the matter is ready, we can speak about transplant transplanting you need we have to refer to natural indexes. So plate transplantation is a very particular case, but 
let us come back to the answer of the begin, begin, beginning. Why have I set five years to understand uh, if we uh, have worked uh, properly? Because after five years, we can consider the stability and if we uh, met the stability because you can see different uh, uh, index for example the number of bundles and so on and this is the case of Santa Marinella um, C same thing happened in uh, uh, Ischia but pay attention because we observe, for example, in Santa Marinella C, that after 12 years, 15 in Santa Marinella, 12 in Ischia, we saw that the transplanted meadow was bigger than the natural one. But we observed that the transplanted meadow have um, tiny leaves because there is um, rhizomes that constitute the mat of Posidonia and that's different com in comparison with the natural one. When the scheme will be the same, will be the same of the natural meadow, we don't know yet. We have to wait and to keep studying. Thank you, Professor Scardi. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to give the floor to Michele Munafo, Isprasina, the National System of Information. But let's watch the video before. What have you watched? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. We have watched a recent tool we've presented uh, uh, a few days ago called Equatlante. This is the logic we used and we mentioned today, giving the right attention and paying the right attention to data. 
for example, it's important to have uh, an available data. And we have seen the same phenomena when we have studied the usable libraries. So it's very important in our work to take a right decision. And this information is very important. We have already said it for different different aspects. I mean, in order to find the perfect site or a, um, a site that fix, we have to understand several measures. For example, the special factor. We have to considering. We have to consider the map. I don't have any slides, but I'm going to speak very briefly. And I'm going to explain my idea. So we have to consider a geographical condition, geographical information, for the reason we call this project Atlante. Because the children we speak with before, of course, uh, uh, study geography. And we have to understand that when we face an environmental challenge, and we saw that, and we watched in the video that it's fundamental having this vision of the space. It has to be a place that invests on the territory, land, and marine territory. So, from this point of view, the availability of information is fundamental. This morning we have spoken about impact, very important for the transparency. For the reason is we need um, available and um, an information with liability. And we have to emphasize that with the born of uh, several agencies for the environment, for example, ISPRA and so on, we received a very important task. We have to share the official information about the condition of our country. And we receive this responsibility with our colleagues, with 10,000 colleagues of uh, our offices when we, for example, work on institutional and uh, monitoring activities. And the information is something we have to have and something that has to be available for everyone. For the reason, we need all the tools, but not uh, difficult tools. We need clear and effective and easy tools in order to let everyone use this uh, information with like a journey that can focus on several aspects. Speaking about Posidonia matters, uh, anthropic studies, developing of uh, development of territory, natural disasters and so on. They could be far aspects. At least they could seem uh, far aspects, but we notice that that's not true because it's very, it's very important after receiving this information to integrate the information we received. So we have to find the connection be between the anthropic activity and the pressure or the connection between uh, the alteration, the climate or environmental alteration and the impact of the ecosystem we are living in. So these factors led us to discover this tool and the challenge we have is to update this tool, to add new contents, new information, 
that can be useful for everyone. And of course, this is one of the goals uh, we want to meet. We want to give and provide data to take better decisions and to give more information to experts, to children, to families, and to everyone who wants to uh, know better the environment in order to live in a better place. So this is my, my consideration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good luck and enjoy the meeting. Ah, sorry, before speaking about the next topic, I would like to focus in on the monitoring process because it's important to manage the data. We have to compare it. So Michele said, ah, sorry, Professor, Professor Scardi, Michele Scardi of uh, Tor Vergata University said, it's very important to improve. And he said that uh, 10 years could be a long period. Yeah, of course, that's right. But that's not so much because we can manage, we can improve the governance of the next 10 years. Because if uh, we need, some, sometimes it's very complicated because we need to wait 30 years to understand if the anthropic uh, uh, meadow is like the natural one. But 10 years can be managed by the governance perspective. Because we can manage the plan, the monitoring activity in 10 years. That's not obvious. As Barbara said, at first we thought that we had to mm, control the area for a lot of years. We didn't think that we could uh, understand the situation just with five or ten years. But we discovered that this is possible. So ten years, even if uh, seem a very long period, that's a, a, a period we can manage. So, of course, that's more complicated. We have to, um, we should briefly uh, explain the situation and briefly you, we should uh, act to improve the risk we are facing. But that's a central aspect in order to understand the possibility we have. Uh, uh. Let's consider now the relationship, the topic of next generation and the link with uh, Posidonia Oceanica. Yes, of course, there are many people that work on this. Um, I think that we have here Alessandro Piazzi of Setin, and I would like to ask him um, on wha what uh, social aspects, we will see the approach on this project. Uh, hello, welcome, um, thank you, thank you so much. Well, this the mission of this project is not to write only guidelines, uh, and we will see this in the future. We analyzed uh, with um, socioeconomic analysis, and we asked the citizens that live in the places where the transplants were carried out, and we asked them um, their opinion, and from the outcome out, outcomes that we got, we saw that all the people realize and understand the importance of these transplantations. But there is a weak point, uh, as we said before, uh, because they are happy of what it was done. There is a general support for this project, but 
um, many of them didn't know what was happening. But we have already talked about the information that are not shared before. We asked the citizens, the locals, and in particular to some qualified people and experts of that territory, besides the organizations that work in that territory, and they knew the technical aspects linked to the conservation of Posidonia Oceanica, and they answered that their main um, concern is the constant erosion of those um, environments and the interventions uh, that are carried out for the maintenance. So the last question that we analyzed was the economic aspects for the future, for the next generation, for the conservation of Posidonia. Can this uh, uh, give us job? Can this employ people putting aside the research operations and considering the transplantation operation, operations, can we create specific figures and specific experts? Uh, maybe they, they do, but from the analysis that we carried out, uh, the transplantation actually employ people, give work to people, and the cost that is necessity to uh, face for these uh, restoration maintenance uh, processes uh, has some um, figures that can be um, that can be paid and this is why we are happy because all the products of life sepos can contribute and are uh, now contributing uh, to the sustainability of the green jobs that are linked to the conservation of Posidonia. This is why we li leave at um, Next Generation these documents uh, that can be a starting point for uh, develop a future develop and for the Posidonia and uh, all the other governance analysis that are crucial and that can be studied in uh, others um, in other activities this is um, um, uh, my hope for the future and i hope that the future will be uh, positive thank you thank you for all those good news carmen malagisi legambiente What opportunities does the codification of these activities uh, related to Posidonia transplants open to society and especially to the world of young people? Well, I just want to talk about young um, people and also the point of view of Legambiente because we have the opportunity to uh, let citizens um, understand the importance of the systems uh, and um, the direct relationship that uh, exists with the production of the environment. Uh, so we try to um, let them understand the important importance of this topic, even if we are experiencing now um, an emergency concerning the climate change. Uh, when we created the guidelines, uh, we wanted to use a winning strategy. And this is why I um, want to repeat what Alessandro was saying before. In particular, in the, in the sectors in which it's important to be well uh, specialized and experts, but for new generation, we have to create a new path to have more uh, ex um, specialized people and experts to analyze all those uh, uh, measures that can have a direct impact on the systems and that 
can also give an, an, an indirect impact concerning the job opportunities and also to bring a new opportunity on um, to everyone, in particular when we talk about the more exploited sectors, uh, of course the marine one. Then considering the world of young people, we know that they have to face unemployment that it's quite persistent um, and uncertainty due to many factors, uh, but we can't deny that the, um, the climate change uh, has uh, a strong impact uh, and the difficulty with which we um, can find our place in the society is, um, um, is uh, uh, very, very big. But we have to be experts, and in this uh, context, I think the organizations and the general bodies must have the duty to provide the tools. The um, and Lega Ambiente, uh, I in Lega Ambiente, I have the possibility to talk with many students in raise awareness um, about this on these topics. And even if uh, they are not experts, uh, they don't know the um, precise words uh, to use, uh, they know that the climate change is an obstacle for the future. And uh, this is not um, a positive thing. This doesn't push us to do more, but this hinders us. Uh, this is why in this uh, very complex framework, uh, I think that facilitate uh, the green competencies uh, and provide tools, uh, answers to the question of the choices in the uh, labor board. We have a great impact uh, on race awareness on dynamics and topics and risks of um, the environment. And we can also consider the risks of the uh, young people and the possibility that they have to use these tools to um, start a new path of empowering uh, and also to um, have to be um, protagonist of a new advocacy process. Thank you, Carmen. This is very interesting. Well, Barbara, this is fundamental for you, right? Yes, I have to say that we are that we are engaged in this, and I always believe that my job is to tell adults what we do, but young people uh, play a fundamental role, and they are. Um, a support for the future and also for your future jobs. And this makes us understand that there is a great interest in the green jobs, the so-called green jobs, because we always believe that scientific uh, topics are not well seen. But actually, this is very interesting. Your intervention was very, very important. So thank you so much. So I would like to thank you all for your interventions. I think that we don't have time for questions. You will find us uh, among the stands or at the buffet. So if you want uh, to ask questions, uh, we are here. And at half past two, we will start. The other part, there is a, a great space for other stakeholders that will talk about very interesting and crucial thing because the networking is crucial and in particular compare the different jobs and the different projects because sharing, uh, we can reach something more and we can understand the other's activities. So if we can be quite... Um, Fast, let's meet here at half past two. So thank you so much.
nostri a radici.
Chiara Eloa. Sì. Brava, sì, ora va. No? Sì, va, però no. Aspetta. Okay. Okay. Siamo per iniziare in ok, welcome back. Let's start again. As during this evening we are going to listen to more interventions, if you want, you can use the translation service taking headphones. Benvenuti, buonasera. Welcome back. Good afternoon. Here we are. No, now we are going to debate on our topic, communication, sharing of information and networking in European projects. We would like, before starting, to thank the technicians for their work. So, do we have a connection with Lynn Barrett. Good afternoon. Monitoring team life, Nimo. Thanks for inviting me this afternoon. Um, we've heard of a lot today about science and monitoring and governance and policy, but actually what does all of this mean and what does it matter if we can't actually communicate the outcomes and the outputs to the right audience in an effective way. So I'm just going to try and set the scene for this and I'm going to try sharing my screen now. Hopefully I'll pick the right one and here we go. Okay, ce l'abbiamo. Okay, great. Well, in the live program, we love to talk about everything we do and we encourage everybody to, uh, to communicate effectively the outcomes of their projects to appropriate audiences from the general public to decision makers. But each one of these groups needs a different approach and a different set of tools. And I'm going to use some examples of communications using, actually I'm going to use plastic pollution in the ocean because you've heard a lot about seagrasses already and you're going to hear a lot more this afternoon. So I'm going to use some examples to stimulate some further discussion. Okay, so most of you will recognize this gentleman and in uh, December of 2017, Sir David Attenborough shocked the world with images of plastic pollution in the ocean during his groundbreaking television series, The Blue Planet 2. Now, the impact of that communication was dramatic and it had far-reaching consequences, not just in Europe, the impact was on a global scale. And we all became aware that plastic was everywhere in the ocean from the outermost atolls to the deepest depths of human exploration it seems that really nowhere was safe. And nothing in the ocean was safe either. And nobody wanted to see these enigmatic species caught up in discarded fishing nets, eating plastic bags and feeding plastic pellets to their young, or creatures swimming through a sea of plastic waste. They were emotive pictures. And what was the reaction to all of this? Well, it led to an outcry across the globe from the public to politicians, awe inspiring, inspiring, haunted by plastic pollution. And from internationally recognized journals and highly acclaimed journals, environmental emergency disguised as a nature documentary, to the tabloid press, crying an ocean. So everybody was interested, everybody was engaged. And what was the outcome of all of this? Well, it didn't just stop with the programme. 
campaigns took off. Sky Ocean Rescue launched in June 2018 with plastic pollution in the ocean as a focal point. Funding poured in, it became available. In 2018, Circulate Capital launched their Preventing Ocean Plastic Fund. In 2019, Oceans 5 launched the Plastic Solutions Fund. And in February 2022, uh, the group of European investment banks raised 4.6 billion to stop plastic waste. People were engaged. You don't get 1.2 thousand, uh, sorry, million likes if you're not doing the right thing. And what did that lead to? UN resolution in 2022 to end plastic pollution in the ocean. Okay, so why do we communicate? We don't expect every life project to have this kind of success and impact, but it does illustrate the power of effective communications and dissemination of knowledge. There are lessons to learn about why we communicate. We need to choose the right topic. We need to understand what the outcome is that we want. We need to know how we communicate. Choose the right audience and the right platform for that communication. There's no point in, in uh, communicating through Twitter uh, if your audience is all on Instagram. What we communicate, choosing the right messages. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to look at a couple of life project examples that are not related to seagrass beds, but are related to plastic pollution in the ocean. And the first of these, and I hope this video will play, is a project called the Life Debag Project uh, from Greece. And I want you to just watch this for a moment to show the power of communication. Okay, so that project actually cleaned up 85% of plastic on beaches and 65% of plastic on the seabed. And at the end of the day, it resulted in a sea change in policy in Greece and introduced a ban on one-use plastic bags in, uh, across, across the country. And it was instrumental in bringing about that change in uh, policy. So that's a really fantastic result. And this uh, Italian project, Clean Sea Life, um, set out to empower people to promote cleaner seas. Yeah, okay, so it did deliver on the MSFD Descriptor 11, but nobody that you're communicating to really cares about the policy, but they do care about plastic straws on the beach and they do care when those plastic straws get stuck in the nasal cavities of sea turtles. So the team, this team went fishing for litter. They engaged 170,000 people in cleanup and dissemination activities over a four year period. They did 1,000 cleanup operations and 1,000 dissemination events and they removed 112 tons of plastic from the beaches and the seafloor. And they also, through networking with another uh, life project called MedSharks, led to an additional, uh, to a national law banning microbeads in cosmetics in 2020. So that's another amazing result. 
So I've only got five minutes. It's a huge topic and there's so much I've missed out from citizen science through to learning with children and, and inspiring future generations. Um, but the important thing is that communication has to have a point. It has to have a purpose. And that purpose needs to be clearly defined. And when it is clearly, clearly defined, communication can be an excellent tool for bringing about policy change, governance change, and people listening to the science. And thank you for listening to me. And I think it's time to hand over to the next speaker. Grazie mille, Lynn Barrett, grazie mille. Thank you so much. Thank you for your intervention. Now, Monica Tergusi from ISPRA. Which kind of communication do you have and you have uh, done? As my colleague uh, Lynn said, we have to understand uh, the target. And in doing this morning, we understood that the project The Life Seposso had a relationship, a direct relationship with, um, um, with different brackets of population. So we had to make, um, to make different our message, depending on the bracket of population. So let's start with my slides, my presentation. Thank you. What could we say? Of course, we have several topics, and a topic like Posidonia Oceanica is not well known. So, first of all, we had to create empathy. We connected the topic of Posidonia Oceanica with the richness of the environment. In order to create a relationship between people and this plant. A lot of people thought that it was a, a, a sea whip, so we had to create empathy. We had to foster the development feeling. We created a comics. In order to involve and create curiosity, in, uh, especially in children, as they have done this morning, after this, after explaining the function of this plant and the system where it lives, we wanted to transmit an important message in connection with the risk that suffer that this plant suffers. And to do this, we spoke about transplantations and all the aspects with different targets. And of course, the language changes as well, depending on the target. As we said, uh, of course, can be uh, this plant can be uh, transplanted, but that's not an alibi. We have to be aware of uh, um, the danger that the um, human action could create. So we wanted to foster the attitude, a new attitude. We created a website and other projects to share information with the citizen. For example, we wrote some rules, do not pollute, uh, do not uh, use the anchor and so on. Could be obvious, but that's not so obvious because this is an important message. This is a personal message. This was very important to pay attention to this plant, to look after it, because we are not speaking just about Posidonia Oceanica. Please. Uh, Claudia Delfini of ISPRA, which kind of activity 
have you realized in order to share the information? Good afternoon. Thank you. As Monica said, these messages had a um, very important aim. We wanted to share and transmit the message with our citizens, uh, partners, and uh, stakeholders to let them change their attitude. For example, with good practices, do not pollute, do not, uh, um, do not fish if a uh, um, meadow is growing there, and so on. And in order to do this, we had to explain the consequences and the characteristics, the main characteristics of this plant. We reached 35 schools of 1,400 uh, students. We told them this story with these comics, and children and students could discover this amazing topic not just with a book or a comic, we realize it uh, personally with a video that showed um, the um, activity of diving team that was connected with uh, uh, lessons and uh, students. It was a new thing for the students, but very interesting one. We created um, a short video, translated in English as well, available on our website. In order to help the activity we have carried out, we help the teachers as well with a, an educational kit. We deliver 900 kits. It's available in our website as well. And this kit is composed by a first part that uh, presents the information of the plant and a second part that um, has a little game inside in order to understand if students have already understood the meaning and the importance of uh, protection of this plant. After we try to share the information with uh, adults as well. We realized uh, several advertisements, seven. Four of them were about uh, transplantations. One of them fundamental about anthropic impact, especially in connection with Posidonia Oceanica, that was so important to understand the impact uh, the, of people on this plant and another one to let our users understand how and why uh, do we have to look after it. More than 25,000 people so this video, but we continue working because we went to square, we went to cities with a stand, with expositions, because we wanted to speak personally and directly with citizens, with tourists, with people who, who were living in these areas. And in this way, we had the possibility to describe to them the importance of transplantations, the project we had started already. Why? Because we discover a great interest from them. A lot of people already knew, knew this plant. Of course, someone thought that it was a seaweed, someone thought it it was a plant or something else, but we saw, and for the reason we decided to uh, keep the work, we discovered that 
the in people's interest existed for this reason during the pandemic work we worked as well and was very interesting the information linked to the development of project sharing information and so on and we use our website and our social network to share this message with more than 2,000 uh, users uh, in our social network. And we counted over uh, more than 35,000 visits in our website during the pandemic. We participated in 23 public events. We organized 17 workshops with a particular uh, target and experts to explain in a better way, of course, the technical aspects, speaking about governance and what we are commenting just now. And after we had 18 events more, with national and international experts in order to extend our knowledge and in order to share our results. But we didn't stop there because our communication activity was so important and was like the te technical one. So we wanted and we created a network connection creating a networking around the world. Thank you. Now let's give the floor to Fabio Bertasi. Thank you, Monica. Yes, as Claudia said, we focused on the research and on the connection between the different realities that work on Posidonia Oceanica transplantation regarding research, of course, but including local um, bodies as well. And I'm speaking about the bodies that experience a protected habitat. So we involve diving uh, associations, fishers, fishermen, and so on. Uire le interazioni che esistono tra di loro per trovare. Of course, we created interaction to provide the right governance tool. For the reason it was very important to understand the connection between these subjects. We had to involve them who are involved in these transplantations, politicians as well for their policies People will work on uh, um, monitoring and users, normal users, and uh, citizens as well, stakeholders and so on. So after focusing this topic with um, several subjects, we follow a methodological approach and we divided them into several schemes, several tables that we are constantly updating. We know that some of them are essential bodies, but it was very nice to see an active participation for a lot of projects, especially in social network, because this virtual space is the perfect one to understand and to share the information with, uh, with uh, citizens and bodies. 
it was important not just to transmit something, but also to obtain an information. And for the reason we started working with uh, live projects, these are our main collaborators. We worked um, at least uh, until now, at least with 13 live projects. We uh, started with Interreg Rhizomes uh, project. After we developed a um, regional project and the Italian Naval League as well. One of the projects I would like to tell you is the uh, Afrimed project. And we had a contact with Criamo PA. That's another internal project of the um, Ministry of uh, Technological Development. And through this activity, we had 47 subjects and stakeholders, different uh, organizations that help us to start this change, this exchange of data. And in this way, we could uh, share our information and acquire their information. And we are speaking about repeatable projects, and that's so important to improve our research. So I would like to conclude thanking you for your effort, for your intervention, for your participation. Sorry, I don't want to forget anyone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Bertazzi. Thank you. Sorry? So, have you noticed that we didn't in, um, invent anything? So now we are connected with Maria del Marotero of uh, IUCN Med. Welcome. So could you describe the role of uh, IUCN Med for the good practices of um, Mediterranean Sea? Good afternoon, everybody. Can you confirm that you can listen? Just only. Yes. Si, si. Yes, thank you. So good afternoon and thank you for the invitation to the meeting and to, to be here with you. Um, um, from the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, as you know, we are an organization present in more than 160 countries in the world and also um, an organization that is very much the link between government and no government work. And uh, as a member, organizations are from both uh, the civil society and also from the governments. So um, we are always in this phase of the middle ground on how to transform and how to create synergies between both uh, worlds, between science-based knowledge passing to policy and the opposite, how the policy should be passed to the, also to the population and the and to the stakeholders at the ground where they are implementing the actions. So our work is always in, in this phase. Um, IUCN also have a, a commission for seagrasses that is the one also working with us on, on the red list assessments. With this, we are also all the time uh, up, approaching it to, to work with many of the experts that help us out to create the status of the of the seagrasses as they're advancing. And I have to say over the last years, what we are seeing is that the seagrasses in some parts of the world, especially in the Mediterranean, we are getting better. We are getting better in conscious about and dissemination and knowledge. And I think this is also part of the, the information that has been created and all these communication plan channels that they are we are investigating and we are looking at it. And I think everybody is touching many, many of these walls that has been mentioned. Um, so our work is also involving into that part. Um, the, 
what we do a lot is networking, obviously, from us, networking between different projects. When we're doing, uh, we have quite a few large, uh, European projects as well. Uh, among them, some of the ones that are going to be presented a bit more in detail there. So I know I don't want it to, to present them now because it wouldn't be unfair. But also, with this, we are addressing different types of uh, challenges as well. Uh, trying to concentrate. And when we're organizing things within our own projects as well, that where we participate, we have always this connection between uh, north and south, for example, in the Mediterranean, where a lot of transfer of knowledge has to be done, or east and, met, on east and west as well, for non-EU countries as well. And that part is, is always good because um, by addressing a little bit some steps, we can get into the conservation of the whole ecosystem in there. Um, some of the activities that we work, for example, we organize a capacity building for restoration, and we invite the colleagues from Seposo to be there with us, or we are organizing activities for uh, private enterprises, and there we are inviting other financial stakeholders to be with us. Um, but then I think I like the, the first sentence that the, that it was introduced by Lynn Barrett, I think from Nemo, that is the, the importance on how you communicate to different stakeholders is always the, the challenge in there, no? Um, and I think the, the future is to make these, these things that they are in the long term stable. And that is that they're not only project driven, but they stay in the society and they stay in the different stakeholders. And sometimes it's um, what we're doing as well is, for example, working with journalists. We are making meetings with journalists, workshops with them, and then they are the ones that release the information. They are the ones that channel in their own words what has to be there, there for the public. And that way is also a way to, to maintain a little bit the capacity from them and also for them to get to the wider public as well. Um, I think today the challenge on, on the network between different organizations, different initiatives as well, not only, only those ones driven by, by project orientated. I think one of them is the Posidonia Network. And I think one of our colleagues is going to be presenting this one. That It was addressed also by EU, but um, initially by an EU meeting but also um, move up into something more uh, informal way to address the challenges of anchoring in with the Posidonia. And I think other ones have come up, and now we are working also on, on a big communication campaign to address to the tourist sector as well. So you will see this in the next week or two starting because that is one of the sectors where more efforts are needed because we have a big summer uh, crew in the Mediterranean, for example, that need to understand as well what is the importance on be healthy and not treating the ecosystem that we are always enjoying it so much. So we are, in the way how we're doing it, it's also trying to get to the, be in the position of the other ones to communicate in that way. But I think um, we... Addressing it to the policy, and that is my last comments that I wanted to share. Um, you know, we have many ways on addressing policy. As IUCN, we also, every four years, and reminded the last year was the, the World Conservation Congress, with many motions were approved. And the, these motions are a way to address many of the policy challenges at the international level. From these motions is where it started the 30 by 30 protected area uh, that is now under discussion under the CBD, for example, in 2016. Um, um, so far, also working literally with some of the regions as, as the ones that are present now is also another way to do it. At the Barcelona Convention, we are also taking a lot of the information that is getting in many of the different projects at the Mediterranean level and moving all the, in a more synthetic way, obviously, where uh, the inputs are coming, where they are, we find it more important for this uh, um, managing approach at the Mediterranean level. So we are talking about monitoring, where we are talking about the action uh, 
a plan for seagrasses or where we are talking about the strategy for biodiversity or the fisheries strategies at the GSCN or, or other ones. No? And I think that is the role where we are uh, playing more of it. And I hope uh, we can continue participating in this kind of forums where we can interchange more with everybody on, on this. So thank you very much. And later on, a little bit more feedback. Grazie, grazie lei. Thank you, thank you, Maria del Mar Otero. I would like to thank you, uh, Claudia Delfini, Fabio Bertasi, Monica Targusi, for your intervention. Now we would like to invite speakers a second topic, the recovery of marine forests in Italy and in the Mediterranean Sea. Please, Barbara. I uh, let introduce the marine forest. Um, yes, we, as, as we said this morning, uh, we wanted to widen the horizons uh, of the marine forest. Um, so there is not only the forest of Pisidonia in the Mediterranean Sea. So this is why we wanted to um, listen to many other projects. And these are all the people that will explain the other kind of forests. So we can go on. And this is the spirit of Posidonia and more. Let's start with uh, Stefano Agunto. Welcome. Good evening. So, um, How was the restoration of Posidonia in the Capo Carbonara MPA? Well, first of all, thank for inviting me and thank you for this question because uh, I can actually explain in this way this technique that you can see here in the slide and how uh, this idea was born, and these that are called uh, um, geocomposites, and the idea was born by the transferring the techniques of consolidations um, developed for use in the terrestrial environment, and by since 2005 we did the first experiments from the EISSD on many surface, on the surface. And the outcomes were quite positive. And uh, this is why we could uh, introduce this technique in the actions of restoration of the meadows in the protected area of Capo Carbonara. The magmat geomats were used. The gel composite is formed from is composed by a structure that has um, filament of polypropylene, and then it was uh, developed uh, in. And the structure, as you can see here, is this one that you can see in the slide. And there is these, uh, these filaments here that are crucial to pick the plants and take them on the um, seabed. And this structure is fundamental because it consolidates the dyed matte that is underneath. This structure is quite um, light, so when it's produced, there is uh, um, a metal uh, wire because um, in this way it's stronger. In marine protected area of Capo Carbonara, the first thing that we did, the first action 
we um, we mm, looked what where what are where the most important sites to uh, consider and to do to carry out these projects. Uh, you can see that in this path are just some meters wide. And we think that they were created when we still hadn't implemented the, pro the project. And maybe these are the results of the trolling that is not allowed here anymore because we have protection measures now. So moving on, once we have chosen the areas, the geomats were positioned and the aim was to facilitate the recolization, the natural recolization of the plant. As we said uh, um, this morning, uh, the plant has um, the possibility to recreate itself. Uh, so in many cases, uh, it happens. Uh, and uh, we wanted to facilitate the um, recreation. So it's not a compensation, but an action of restoration. And just like many others that were carried out in the Mediterranean Sea. Once we have position, once the um, geomats are positioned, we, the other action is to create some um, course of uh, popularization. Well, this project was crucial, but maybe we still haven't talked about this, uh, but we wanted to give more information about this project. Maybe you know that during the first year, in the first years uh, after the transplantation, that is the most delicate year because uh, plants are likely to die. But we wanted to add a new problem, of course, uh, and this is why um, we couldn't uh, uproot the, the plants, but we decided to take the cuttings uh, that, um, the, and this is a, te a technique that could be a solution, an interesting solution, because it could be implemented in the uh, protected areas. But we didn't want to compromise the um, pro donator protect um, meadows. Even in the protected area, there are protection measures uh, that protect the, the plants. But there are also other uh, areas where it's possible um, to carry out uh, uh, entering actions. Moving on, we um, gathered 30,000 cuttings because um, our um, our aim was to um, to repopulate 1,000 square meters of transplanted um, area. Here we have we selected the best areas to transplant to do the transplant process. We gathered the cuttings, and in these images, you can find the, the plots. The cuttings are selected previously, because as I was saying before, many of them uh, must have high standards. Uh, and this is why they are previously chosen, because they should have young leaves 
and uh, um, know that leaves that are um, in the plants. Then here we have recolonization plots. And in this picture, you can see how we disposed them. As we said before, this is a difficult moment when we have to follow and monitoring the transplantation. In this way, having these recolonization plots that are distributed in this way, we can act in two ways that are the assessment and the counting of the the plots that are still in the um, in the implement in the structure and the number of cuttings in this way we can mothering them more um, in an easier way then it was fundamental to understand how easy was for the plant for the plant to die after transplantation we have many cuttings that are protected inside the plot then we noticed that there is not a great difference in the plots and for now we have achieved good results as you can see after three years but we also have better figures of the 2021 the transplant plots that are still in situ are 92 percent it's not 90 percent because the monitoring on that area is not easy so um, these are, despite these, they are positive and good uh, uh, figures. Um, so generally speaking, it's quite good because the plots are still in situ. As for the geomats, they appear to be completely recolonized, uh, as you can see in this picture, by an algal population that is similar to the natural, natural mat and it's a good support for the uh, recolonization. Then the cutting survival rates uh, have stabilized around 50% of initial numbers, and this happened after three and four years. And this figure is very important because those are all the cult cutlings that we uh, gathered around uh, without knowing the the, uh, the the condition because it was studied uh, later but these are very good outlooks for us and this is what we did and uh, now the post life period started so the marine protected area has the possibility possibility to follow the transplantation and we are very happy to do this i would like to add just one thing and then i conclude that um, thanks to these uh, geomats we had the opportunity to develop the bio uh, geomats that are totally natural and we have um, good implantations and I would like to thank um, on behalf of Life Seposo. This is the third year that the implantation is going on and we are very satisfied because we have 100% um, rate of um, biogeomats um, alive and the interesting thing is that after three years uh, from the transplantation and I forgot about this before after three years we can find uh, a better density and much more number of uh, plots and plates and the numbers are mm, positive. So just you to let you understand that we 
passed from 30 cuttings uh, the first year to 21, 22 cuttings, uh, we reached better numbers and we had uh, a higher number of cuttings. Uh, this is why we are very happy and proud. So these are wonderful experiences, but also in the Balearic uh, Islands, uh, there is a recovery action for Posidonia, for Ives Castellon, Castellon of Imedea. Y yes, may I? Yeah, yeah, if you prefer, <laughs> you, you can speak English, okay. sure, no problem. So, I come from the Mediterranean Institute for Advanced Studies in the Balearic Islands, and I'm going to present the transplantation project that we oh, have performed the last year, since 2018. Uh, just uh, the design of the planting, the technique, and some results of the monitoring. Can you please pass the... You need the... This is wrong. Yes, press down. To, okay. Oh, perfect. So, in this project, it's called uh, Red Electrica Marine Forest. We have planted in a natu 2000 natural network area in the north of Mallorca. We have planted two hectares of uh, the great meadow, so the substrate is death mat. And we have used, not as, like Stefano did, we have used uh, a drive material. So we haven't extracted anything from the meadow because it's not allowed in Spain. We just can use uh, fragments that is discarded from the population dynamics. So um, we use fragments of rhizome that contain at least one pleiotrophic group and at least do, uh, two orthotropic shoots. And we plant two hectares, 800 nodes of 16 fragments each node. So the density is more or less between 60 and 70 shoots per square meter. The depth was uh, five meters and is now the area with the degraded area, the, degraded, the old uh, Posidonia meadow, the degraded meadow, is now colonized by Simoceanodosa macroalgae. Uh, the project, the plantation works, lasts between uh, 2018 and 2020 in, five se in, four, in four seasons, so four field campaigns, I mean. Uh, uh, click in that way, that way. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Um, some results that we get, this is from last summer, 2021. Survivorship is pretty good. After four mo 40 months of, from transplant, the, the oldest part of the transplant of the area, I mean, of the transplanted area, has a survivorship over the 95%. And the others is more or less similar. Mm, regarding the development of the, of the fragments, because we follow up the, the number of shoots, we, we label it part of the, of the 2018 fragments that we have planted, are labeled, and we, we follow up this, this individually, this individual, we follow up individually this fragment. So we check how many shoots they have at the beginning and year after year. The number of shoots, the total number of shoots is more or less the same. It doesn't change. It doesn't mean the same shoots are alive, but the fragments are sacrificing the oldest shoots, especially the orthotropic, and generating new ones. It's investing all the resources to the, in the apical uh, group. And the, the number of apical groups per shoot, per fragment, per rhizome fragment, is also is more or less constant, about one which is uh, the structure, the initial, similar to the initial structure that we planted. Uh, for the monitoring, we wanted, this morning someone talked about this, we are interested not just in the plant, we want, of course, the plant survives after planting, but we also want the final aim of any restoration project, which is recover the functionality of the ecosystem. We are 
in this, this first um, stage of the of the representation, I mean, it's in in this early stage of the of this very young meadow, <laughs> initial meadow, we follow up the epifaunal community and fish community, both adults and uh, juveniles. What you see in the image is the distribution of fish. The dark green is the established meadow, the natural meadow, and this rectangle in the other green, the clearer green, is the restoration area. As you can see, two years after transplant, the restoration uh, intervention has not, is not attracting the fish to there, so the fish is still concentrated in the, in the, established, in the established meadow. Um, we really expect that because uh, probably we will not see anything until the, um, the habitat that our plots generate are, is, is big enough to, to be detected by the fish or the epifauna. We will not see a change, a really migration of biomass from the natural meadow to the restored area. Uh, finally, just um, to a comment, a, a really short comment about project governance. This project is, um, well, it's, it's not caused by, by any intervention. I mean, in this, in this area, there's not an impact. We choose this area because of a multi-criteria decision process, but it's not co uh, a consequence of a previous impact. But it's funded by a, by a private, private company, which contacted us to design the project and we contact the public administration and at regional and national level to coordinate because the legislation is, is crazy to get the, the, the permissions to do this. It's really crazy. It's not, we are not prepared at all. So thanks to this uh, three, <laughs> three legs <laughs> scheme of uh, collaboration between the three uh, kind of, in, of entities, private company, academics, and public administration, we were able to this, this, the, develop this um, quite big restoration inter intervention, which is the biggest uh, that we have done in Spain until now. And well, we keep working and we are with the same technique. I haven't said the anchoring system, I think I forget it. The anchoring system is individually with an iron staple, it's plant, and with the same technique we are, we are starting new projects in the other Balearic Islands and maybe in the future in the mainland. So thank you again for your, your time and your attention and for the invitation. Grazie, grazie mille Ines, grazie mille, buon lavoro. Very interesting, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ines. Uh, now, play Mood and Fiona Clouds, Life and Medias. Uh, hi, Fiona. Remedies Project. So I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully. You can see that. Thank you, Fiona. Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so I work for Natural England. We're the lead partner um, in the Life Recreation pro Project, which is reducing the mitigation, erosion and disturbance impacts affecting the seabed. And we have another number of partners, so the Royal Yachting Association, Marine Conservation Society, Ocean Conservation Trust, and um, Plymouth City Council. I'm just going to sort of briefly take you through um, what we are and planning to do. So we started in July 2019, and we aim to improve the condition of former marine habitats for European importance. Um, so as you can see them there, mainly around sandbanks, mudflats, sandflats, estuaries, and large shallow inlets and bays. And really focusing on two of those sub-features, uh, which are seagrass and mill. And in this case, when we talk about seagrass, it's not Posidonia, uh, we're focusing on Zostra marina. So these are the five special areas of conservation we're working in. So from west to east, Isles of Scilly, 
uh, Fallon Helford, Plymouth Sound Estuaries, Solent Maritime and the Essex Estuaries. And the reason we're really focusing these on these SACs within Southern England, it's where um, we have the most evidence that um, habitats such as our seagrass are in unfavourable status. And as we know, um, that's not a good thing. Um, so we need to work on trying to improve um, the status of those habitats. And that's what we're trying to do through remedies. And our seagrass and merle and our seabed habitats, they are um, under a lot of pressure from different areas. But what we're really doing in remedies is targeting um, recreational users um, and, for example, boaters. So um, one of our first objectives is looking at that recreational pressure. Um, so through the Royal Yachting Association, um, we're doing training um, with boaters. And also a big part of our work is behaviour change. Um, so trying to understand um, stakeholders' attitudes, um, their values, um, how they see that environment they work in, and seeing how we can work with them um, to help them understand and um, help them to reduce their impact on the environment when they're enjoying the ocean. Second one is, like we've heard a lot about uh, this afternoon, it's also trying to um, uh, trial in successful restoration and management techniques. So we are um, have an ambition to restore eight hectares of seagrass, Zostra, um, in Plymouth Sound and Solent, so four hectares in Plymouth and four hectares in the Solent. And then also trial in advanced mooring systems, so trying to remove that large amount of chain that we have on traditional moorings, which are scouring the seabed. And then finally, um, looking at promotion, awareness, we've heard a lot about communicating, it's important we communicate the work we're doing um, within the UK and also across Europe. And we have um, a large education programme as well, so going to different schools and communities to raise awareness of the importance of those seabed habitats. And talking about communication, uh, rather than me carry on talking, a short video um, about the uh, restoration work that we started in Plymouth Sound um, last summer. being packed and um, sealed by our volunteers behind us. So we have a Hessian bag which is sustainably and ethically produced. It's completely biodegradable. We fill the Hessian bag with sand, we put 30 seeds in each bag and then we just tie it off with a Hessian string. And this is what the volunteers behind me are doing here today at the National Marine Aquarium. So this morning we're in Jennycliffe Bay and we're deploying 3,000 557 bags that were created by our volunteers yesterday and what we do is we run down transect lines or predetermined lines slowly and we deploy the bags at roughly one a second and that gives us a spacing of about 50 centimeter intervals when on the seabed and then the bag leaves the tube floats down to the bottom of the sea and sits nicely on the seabed where it will germinate. Generally, the site is seeing a decline in seagrasses and with a decline in seagrasses, we lose the service value that that gives to the community. So by restoring this, we are restoring habitat and nursery for juvenile fish, fin fish and shellfish. We're, um, stabilising sediments and also hopefully storing some carbon as we go. Seagrass is a really important um, habitat for mitigating climate change. <laughs> and why? Because imagine it's like um, the rainforest underwater, so everyone knows the importance about the rainforest. Well, seagrass is a flowering plant, it photosynthesises just like trees. 
So it actually is capturing that CO2 and producing oxygen. So it's removing that CO2 as rainforest does, um, but it's doing it underwater. So I would say what we need to do is we all need to, as a society, conserve what we have and restore what we've lost. And of course, none of this would be happening if it wasn't for the support of our funders, um, the EU Life Programme. Um, so yes, that's available on YouTube, as you can see. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> so that's a very brief run through about what we're doing with um, remedies. We've got another couple of years to run, so hopefully as time goes by, um, as time goes on, we'll be um, uh, producing more products and more information. And you can see our website there um, that you can go to to find out more about our project. So thank you for listening. Grazie mille. Thank you, thank you. And uh, um, thank you for being here and you did a wonderful job. Now, Andrea Bonometto, Life Serresto. What are the common points uh, of these meadows and these uh, uh, seedweeds? Uh, and what's the difference with the marine um, um, environment and the lagoon environment? Uh, of course, thank you. Um, of course, there are many um, things that are uh, the same. If this is why the title of the, uh, this meeting is fundamental. Now we are talking about lagoons. So we have Sostranozzi, Yuppa and many other uh, types of plants, uh, as we saw also in the other um, presentations uh, and these are different species because they adapt to uh, new temperatures and new health conditions and uh, seabed conditions because the it's much m more full of mud and sand also the characteristics are completely different uh, and this is how these species can adapt uh, their ecosystemic role is uh, quite similar and um, in, for, in particular for the seabed, for the oxygen that they have. And in these environments, lagoons and sea are quite similar. And, uh, and we are studying these uh, kinds of environments that are similar. I can say that the as for the recreative re part, we can say that they are the we have much more muddy environment if we compare them with the sea. But some conditions are different when we uh, estimate the ecosystem differences. Uh, we can find many factors, uh, but generally speaking, the functions are quite the same. Yes, the functions are similar and also the uh, problems are similar. In Europe and in Italy, we saw in the last 10 years uh, a degradation of the um, seaweeds. Uh, and these are the images of Serresto project in the Venezia lagoon. And a difference could be that in the lagoon environment, uh, there is a great regression and also atopic regressions uh, quite uh, diffused uh, that are negative for the uh, breeding and also for the waters. These are indirect and also direct uh, effects. As you can see from the pictures, the uh, waters are much more muddy. And what we want to do is to recreate the proper um, environment conditions uh, to uh, start a transplantation. 
Another difference is that many times we can see uh, differences uh, in the sea widths uh, and in the sea in widths that we can find in the lagoon. These, um, uh, in this case, we also have different techniques um, because in the Posto project, uh, we had our restore um, uh, project that was uh, that it's impossible to apply in the lagoons um, because the materials should be uh, the material is um, not compatible with the uh, that environment. So the aim is to start a nature transplantation, and in this context, live posso find uh, 35 points in which it's possible to start a transplantation. And we started nine uh, plots, 30 centimeters every uh, plot, and 100 uh, rhizomes in um, each uh, plot. In terms of surface, uh, uh, we are around one squared, me squared me meter. This means that when there is a transplantation, the result is uh, zero. And we also have ma many problems because uh, it's difficult to find the transplanted pot in the lagoon. There is the risk that the transplantations are not um, achieved, but in that case, we can um, hope for a natural transplantation or an artificial one. The one that um, are achieved, um, they can lead they led to um, a natural transplantation. Here, we can find uh, um, a manual transplantation that is handmade, as you can see here, because it's quite uh, easy. But it requires uh, many people working on this. In this case, we had fishermen in the in Venezia Lagoon because they know quite well the ter territory, and they achieved uh, this uh, transplantation. Another difference uh, for the lagoons is that the space is uh, completely different, as we said before. There are sites that are um, better than others for the transplantations. But in the lagoon, these conditions change completely. We can find, uh, we can find the spaces that are uh, litter, little, but they are, they are good, but they have to be studied. Uh, the, um, there, where the rhizome can, uh, rhizome can um, breathe, that is the um, elected uh, site for the transplantation. OK, perfect. Uh, um, I think that the lagoon is not that deep as the, the sea. And it's quite good because water is also muddy, the conditions are different, and we can uh, implant the rhizome um, properly. There in Venezia in uh, 2019, we saw that we achieved what we wanted to achieve, and these exper experiments uh, are carried out without uh, the support of un anchoring. If the if the project uh, don't, doesn't reach what we expected, we um, we have to study more and to understand the risk and difficulties. Uh, here we have um, uh, Rossella Boscolo. We have an introduction, uh, an introduction, a brief video. Lavoro in una valle da pesca qui nella laguna nord di Venezia. E ho partecipato a un bando per il trapianto e l'espianto del, del canetto come azienda sul territorio che aveva la possibilità di operare. E andiamo a, 
a ricostruire quella che era la laguna che i nostri bisnonni hanno visto nel, negli anni passati, molto più ricca di, di, di animali, di, di, di pesci, di fauna, perché l'apporto di acqua dolce, secondo noi, anche con l'attività che abbiamo in valle, è apporto di alimento, è apporto di nutrimento per tutta quella che è la vita della, della laguna. Che tipo di What kind of intervention are you carrying out with Lagoon, Life Lagoon Refresh? Hello everybody, let's stay in Venice and this is a project and my colleague Bonometto talked about the transplantation in North Lagoon and uh, a transplantation can be achieved only if we have the good conditions. So we want to recreate an environment that ha we lost during the years. We want to raise the, um, the, uh, the good environment, but it was quite difficult. Uh, we did many anthropologic um, changes. Uh, we changed the course of the rivers that um, reached the lagoon. And this change of the rivers uh, brought to a rise in the salinity and also a reduction of the typical environment that is the inner part of the Venice lagoons that is fundamental because uh, it's like a filter and it's a fundamental habitat for the species. Uh, the project aims to recreate the saline habitat that we lost during the years uh, with the river Sile that brings the water to the lagoon. So this was a hydraulic wo work that didn't use um, um, an artificial way to reach the water. And in the part of the lagoon, as we saw in the other uh, project that was pre presented before, we could uh, 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 save the water that reached the lagoon, and we could uh, create a good morphology for uh, the um, rise of another uh, plant uh, that is fundamental for the ecosystem, uh, uh, for the system, for the oxygens, for the birds of that area, and that can um, enhance and uh, improve the habitat of the lagoon. Besides these concrete actions, uh, there are also other transplantations, uh, as we saw in the video of um, an employee, an, exp an expert uh, that tried to uh, rise in the uh, biodiversity and to reach what we had in the past. And this is fundamental for the Fanerogamen transplantations. So these two projects uh, aimed to um, enhance the environment of the North Lagoon. There is uh, another video, just 10 seconds, please, uh, to let you see the stakeholder action and opinions, because it's important to highlight uh, that in the lagoon environment, the stakeholder engagement uh, must be high and is crucial. And the idea uh, always come, come, comes from them, because they are the one that know the state of the lagoon many years ago and how this pro the lagoon can be always preserved and enhanced. In 2009, we carried out another um, project by the fishermen that um, reached uh, wonderful outcomes and listening to the stakeholders we as researchers can put into practice restoration uh, measures uh, to support a good planning and a good uh, um, uh, achievement. So please, let's look, let's watch the video. For us, the fishermen and fishermen of Venice are representing the world because our world 
se lo preserviamo, se lo curiamo, se lo, se lo guardiamo, possiamo godercelo il più possibile e, e tramandarlo appunto ai nostri figli. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Rossella Boscolo. Now let's give the floor to Annalisa Falace. Here, here you have the mic. Live rock pop. Um, what's about rock pop life? Okay. I. Can you hear me? It's the number six. It's on. Okay. I uh, was saying that um, now we are talking about seaweeds, and I was saying before I'd be brief because otherwise, this topic uh, I could talk for hours about this topic, but we have to share some uh, starting points with the lagoons, but the topic here is completely different. Now we are talking about a seaweed. Can I have the remote control? Okay, perfect. The common point are why we have to restore the causes of disappearing because uh, Chistosera form, forms uh, forests that are uh, crucial and that have uh, um, similar function to the Posidonian ones. Uh, the the Sistosera plays a key role in the marine conservation and uh, we can see that the key drivers uh, is, um, are, are actually quite similar to the others uh, that we were talking about uh, before. The impacts uh, are more or less the same. Okay, let's These are the partners of the project. That is an innovative project because we couldn't rely on too many years of knowledge because we still have few information. It's not clear why uh, it's happening, this disappearance. We know a uh, few things. I started um, a project on restoration, but that name changed three times. So uh, this is, I'm saying this because the taxonomy itself is too difficult. Uh, we believe that there was, was just one kind. Now there are three kinds. So we are studying a lot. And this is the reason why there are two universities involved, uh, the one of Trieste and the Un University of Genoa. And for um, uh, mari marine protected area and other society that helped us. The first objective was to define a protocol for the Sistofera because before we didn't have a real protocol. We didn't know how to um, write one. And this was the first objective to restore the habitat 1170, as Marcelli was saying this morning and um, the Civitavecchia situation. And uh, we wanted to reach a um, good um, uh, environment situation in these areas. We worked in, the, in these two areas that you can see here. And we had a donor site that allowed us to gather the the uh, the plants that we then studied in Strugnan in Strugna, in Strugnano in Strugnan and then we worked in the Luger Liguria region as the donor site and Cinque Terre as receiving site as my colleague was saying before um, our actions are concrete and we wanted to achieve um, some objectives that we have to agree with the European Communion. This is why we started with a protocol and then we activated a process of restoration. In this slide, you can see the little um, 
clay tiles that we prepare ourselves handmade before starting the restoration process and we let the plants grow. Then we developed different protocols for the different species and uh, they were fundamental for this um, for this project. Then we had to face uh, the outplanting situation and finding a new way to put these tiles in the substrate, trying to protect them, in particular in the first parts, uh, in the different actions, uh, um, looking at the uh, death possibility for the plants. And we wanted to avoid uh, completely the use of uh, epoxy or other um, substances because as we were working in marine protected area, it was crucial to uh, maintain an aesthetic um, presentation, um, aesthetic, high aesthetic environment. Very briefly, here you have the output of the project stored uh, one kilometer of the coast uh, in Miramare and uh, half a kilometer in uh, Cinque Terre. Here you can see the plants after the breeding um, project. And a very important part of the project was the replication uh, rock pop life that is not used uh, only in Italy but also in, in Greece, uh, in Slovenia and uh, in other countries of Europe and uh, we have great rate of replication in our countries where we are carrying out other projects like for example in Morocco, in Greece as I was saying and uh, as Marco Marcelli was saying this morning, we will start working in Civita Vecchia and also in uh, the Capri Island for a restoration project. We also were engaged in communication um, uh, processes with many difficulties because as you listen to kids, um, have problems with plants and when you talk about seaweeds uh, it's even more difficult uh, because when you tell people that we have to spend money for the restoration of seaweeds uh, they are not uh, always uh, happy so thank you for your attention and uh, let's move on let's um, listen to Silva Banchielli of Afrimed we should have her here now, uh, can you listen to us, uh, Silvia? The importance of Sisofeira, yes. Good af afternoon. We would like to um, understand uh, the framework of the Sisofeira. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, I'm Silvia Ban Bancelli and I'm talking about uh, um, this new project on behalf of AFRIMED. As I was saying before, AFRIMED is now um, pledged to the um, deterioration of the marine environments and the coastal ecosystems and the Sistofera forests that represent the most productive uh, ecosystem in the Mediterranean coast. This uh, le le led to a loss of biodiversity and uh, also ecosystem um, functions. Afrimed is a project that represents a great challenge because as you can see here in the map, it involves uh, many partners uh, that are not only in, in Europe, but also in other um, countries. Uh, and uh, we have extra-European countries, and this is a great resource uh, that we have in common with other different populations. Uh, the project AFRIMED is based on different pillars. Uh, on uh, 
solid scientific basis that we um, gathered uh, in laboratories, but also in the territory. In AFRIMED, we are also trying to bring our outlooks to a community of stakeholders that are um, interactive network. And we also want to bring our results in the society. The story of AFRIMED starts from um, 2020 project of um, pilot action of restoration in different ecosystems. Um, in a, a, um, everlasting dialogue with other society and in other frameworks to understand the best uh, measures and reforms um, to carry out. This dialogue is fundamental and it's still on in the Mediterranean area. And this allowed us to reach solid basis to start new financial uh, projects just like the uh, national plan for the recovery. Passing on the main uh, results, in AFRIMAD, uh, at the beginning, we um, mapped the forests or the different uh, Tisocera forests with the different partners and the health status of the forest and also the stressors uh, the anthropogenic stressors that those forests have to um, face. Then the, here we can see that uh, there is a special prioritization at the basin scale and that the stressors um, that we can find today are reported here. And we tried to understand what are the Mediterranean areas that um, must be restored. And you, as you can imagine, this was quite difficult because there are many um, areas in the Mediterranean Sea that um, are difficult to study, in particular the forests. Um, Another uh, result was the roadmap that we created to understand the approaches and the protocols uh, that are shared and that can be used today by the countries that uh, were engaged. Here we achieved to have standard protocols that can be used in all the countries that um, uh, were involved in the project. And we will try to understand the new targets and the restoration uh, reforms. Another main result was uh, working with uh, stakeholders and AFRIMED uh, um, as um, this platform where the stakeholders can uh, uh, share their experiences. And we will have another meeting with these stakeholders in uh, May, so in Naples. Um, and this will allow us uh, to work with the stakeholders to find the best practices and when start and implement with um, success the actions in the Mediterranean Sea. The last pillar of AFRIMED is the one to raise awareness on the society 
on the importance of these uh, ecosystems. Um, for this reason, we activated uh, many initiatives, uh, scientific initiatives, uh, and many others uh, dedicated to this topic at European level for the ecologic restoration of many public um, documents uh, and the general public um, and reforms. Um, as we are an academic partnership, our mission is to build a new generation of students and young researchers that are aware and ready to face the, uh, the next challenges. And in the, with this, I would like to conclude, and I really want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Silvia Bianchelli, so we can close now this other topic, Barbara Tiziano, and we can start uh, the protection and management of Posidonia Oceanica Meadows, and we have Fedric Gil Gil Villers. Good evening. Buonasera. Good evening. Welcome. Okay, we can see you. Uh, how is it important to create a network in this framework of uh, management of uh, matters? Well, uh, thank you. My name is Frédéric Villers. I am working for the French Biodiversity Agency. Yes, I will explain you quickly um, the mutual inclusion network that we have been created now two years ago. Um, give you an idea, I mean, thanks for the invitation because the presentation I heard today was really interesting for us. Um, to come back in history to two or three years ago, the European Commission organized the first uh, biogeographical congress about anchors away, which was focused on the impact of anchoring on seagrasses. And uh, it was in December 2019. And after a few days, we decided we people we were present at the conference to go a bit further and carry on as it was really interesting to exchange between uh, all the different countries. Then was the idea to start and to create the Pozina network. Basically, the first idea of this network was to, to better protect Pozina habitat from anchoring. Um, so I just gave you, gave you here some link for the video. But, this thing has been shown in other projects, such as the Girepam, Girepam project. Um, our network basically um, is now two years old and aims basically to gather all the different countries covered by Posidonia habitat and with a long-term objective, which is to basically protect 100% of Posidonia habitat by 2030. Uh, this thing is quite recent. It came from the Media and World's Forum and One Ocean Summit last February. So I guess for some of you, the network is, this uh, network is really new. Just to give you an idea, um, so this network uh, basically we aim to to gather all the different stakeholders from different countries covered by Poisonia Oceanica. I just show you here a quick map of where is Poisonia habitat in the whole Mediterranean Sea. And um, the number of countries or people who basically um, participate in this network. So it's one of 11 countries. Um, in Italy, we already have the UNIJ, the MPI Fortofino, and we also have contacts with the Ligurian region. For us, the objective is really to, to gather everyone, that means some people are working on science and restoration. Some people are working on regulations. Uh, we really bring to, to have authorities, scientists, MPA managers, uh, but also social professionals in the nautical sector. Not only we, we try to gather countries, but also international institutions, so which is the CAR, the IUCN, the WWF, uh, Ramoj Agreement. So we basically try to, to gather everyone who is working on the Posidonia. And basically, the Posidonia community is still uh, small, unfortunately. Uh, what we try to do is basically um, 
to protect 100% of Poisonia, we need to work on different issues. For some countries, such as um, southern countries, sometimes we need more knowledge. That basically means to have a better idea where is Poisonia. And once we know where is Poisonia, what are the different pressures on the habitat? So we need to work on knowledge and monitoring. Once we know what is the pressure, for instance, when about anchoring, we have concrete solutions, which potentially is all regulations or set up rules. And another quite important point for us is raising awareness. You, we all agree here that Poisonia, we can say it's almost our marine Amazonian forest, but it's unfortunately not as famous as Amazonian forest or coral reefs. We also try to, to raise awareness in each country for this thing. And that's the last point, which is about innovation, where we also want to work on it and to try to gather all the different great ideas we can see locally and nationally and try to establish some guidance. So just to give you an idea, uh, so this network is really recent. Last year, we ordered a study uh, by Boulder where we updated the map of Poisonia habitat in the all nutrient countries. So in green, it's basically the area where we have Poisonia and in orange, where we know we have Poisonia, but we need to, to go a bit thorough in terms of details and studies. Um, we created a website uh, where we try to gather all the different regulations and solutions, tools, uh, awareness campaigns from all the different countries um, in English. So it's quite useful for nautical sectors, but also for environmental associations, for instance. For us, the network is really open and we still try to, to go a bit further and to, to invite everyone who is interested in this network. So basically to be part of the network, that means to, to follow some sometimes some Zoom meetings as usual. We try to gather once a year or virtually or physically. We just finished to have a meeting last September in Valeric Island in Formentier, where we basically worked on different brainstorming sessions to see what we had to do. Just show you here some preliminary outcomes for Italy, but uh, just uh, read from the report. Basically, about monitoring, we wanted to be able to separate areas where we know that you have anchoring pressures and areas where we need just to measure the pressures on Poisonia. So it just gives you a quick idea about Poisonia restoration, which I think is a huge focus on the conference today. Uh, we can hear many members from the network giving us some experiments and initiatives in many countries. So we, we realize that we, we really need to, to, to synthesize all the different information in the future to be able to, to have technical guidelines for post restorations. Um, I just put the focus, but you already explained it well this morning, the restoration for us is quite different from compensation. It doesn't give a while to destroy post so this thing, we basically plan to, to do it by the end of the year, beginning of next year. Um, and I just would finish by this thing. Is I think for me today was the opportunity just to quickly present you the network, but we need to invite all of you who is interested in to, to, join, to join us as we really lo looking for each um, relevant stakeholder in each country that can help us to basically elaborate and help us to basically um, start our action plan in different areas, which is regulations, um, restoration, management measures, and of course, raising awareness. I was quick, because I know we are late, but uh, if you have some questions, I'll try to answer. Thank you, thank you so much. Now we would like to give the floor to Maria de la Cita of Life in Tamaris. Good evening, Maria. I think that you listen to us. So the question... Sorry if I'm late with my word. Sorry because I I hear you with a little bit of return. Okay. Thank you everyone for inviting us, all the partners of Seposo. Uh, we are glad to be here. And so much. I will share my window. Sorry, six seconds. Please let me know if you 
see the right. See? See? Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thanks, Yolo. Yeah, well, uh, I'm Maria de la Cita. I work for uh, Biodiversity Foundation, which is a public foundation uh, that belongs to the Ministry for Ecological Transition and, and the Demographic Challenge here in Spain. And I'm a technician part of the project Life uh, in Temares. It's an integrated life project that is very huge and uh, it lasts about around eight years. We'll be finishing, I hope, in 2024. Uh, and the main objective of the, of the project is, uh, sorry, uh, here it is, uh, the main objective of the project is to create an integrated, uh, innovative and participatory uh, management of the Natura 2000 uh, network in the Spanish marine uh, environment. Um, I mean, it's not always related to Posidonia Oceanic and other marine panorogams. It's uh, a huge problem related with a lot of things and, and, and we have a, a lot of different kind of, of activities inside the project. Um, but the, the main objective, as I said before, is to create a, a well-managed, uh, integrated uh, and coherent uh, Natura 2000 network in the marine environment. And for this, we are, uh, have uh, five pillars of actions. Uh, of course, the first one has uh, science as a basic tool for, for the process of decision-making. And, and the, the uh, principal, the, or one of the principles, the other pillars are the participation, involving uh, society in the in the process of decisions taken to manage the Natura 2000 network is the, the, the novelty of the project, and I will be applying it for for uh, conquer and, and gaining uh, all the objectives. Of course, we have another kind of of activities, monitoring of habitat and species, uh, surveillance of the sites of Natura 2000 network, of course, uh, as you were talking before, uh, communication and dissemination activities. And in material of uh, conservation activities, we are working with turtles, cetaceans, seabirds, and of course, uh, marine panorama. Uh, in this framework, uh, uh, Spain is not a, a federal state, but also a kind of, <laughs> and we have uh, two different kind of, of administration, the central administration, which is represented by the ministry, of course, and, uh, and regional administrations, uh, as known as uh, autonomous region. No? And we detected during the, the project that we had uh, a little bit, uh, a little problem with the uh, management of the, of the marine panorogams because uh, the decisions making, the, the process of decisions making about uh, conservation and management of Posidonia uh, was very different. Uh, if you see the, the decisions that were making uh, from, the, from the central government of the regional administrations. Uh, besides, we also have another uh, sectorial uh, partners or a sectorial administration that have competencies in uh, the management and the conservation of Posidonia, Oceanica, and other marine panorogams. And it was a problem because we, they don't have a, a, a tool, a, a practical tool to make a coherent and coordinated decisions. Uh, in this framework, uh, we have started the, the development. Uh, of, a, of a tool that we named <laughs> guidelines, uh, as, the, as the slide said, guidelines for the management and conservation of Posidonia Oceanica and other marine panorogams, which is a practical tool. It's a document, but a practical tool to have uh, five blocks of information uh, with guidelines, clear guidelines uh, about detecting, uh, eliminating, and minimizing, minimizing uh, the, the pressure of the three factors of the Posidonia Oceanica widows. Guidelines for restoration, as you were describing before, in all the, the, the projects that you are uh, developing. Uh, here in Spain, we uh, have started with uh, some kind of experience, as uh, Ines uh, was describing before, but we, we have to create a regional strategy to, uh, to confront all the restoration initiatives that are uh, starting now. Uh, of course, uh, guidelines for monitoring pressures, species, and all the habitats uh, that are to work. Uh, guidelines for management the, the materials that was here ashore because they are a, a, a kind of problem in, in touristic areas like Balearic Island, uh, Valencian community, Catalonia, etc. And to create some it's super important this point uh, an interadministrative and scientific coordination too because it wasn't uh, in the, in a reality, you know, uh, yet. Uh, 
Uh, the, the tool is a practical document, about 40, 50 pages, but it's completed with 11 annexes that compile all the different information about the key topics of the, of the activities. And it's super uh, direct, uh, central and super directed to the managers uh, for, for them to, uh, to make easier for them the, the decision making when for example, they receive a project uh, that can affect the Posidonia middle, how to make uh, the, the monitoring of the project, how to uh, describe all the variables that must be uh, tackled when, when you are making surveillance or monitoring of the project. Uh, we are trying to, with this document, achieve those goals, ensure that all the activities are compatible with the preservation of the, of the final organs, updating all the information, uh, because in, in Spain we are always uploading the information about the, the Positonia Midos and other, other manifold organs like Timodafe, uh, Anodosa, Tostera, Nolti, etc. Promoting that scientific knowledge uh, arrives to the to the transfer uh, uh, to the managers and the and the MPA managers. Consider restoration is an important point of view that scientific sector has transmitted as uh, 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 always. That consider only restorations where where pressures have declined because uh, we are a uh, uh, lot of problems with illegal anchoring and, and things like that. Of course, raising awareness and uh, create an interactive uh, administrative coordination. Uh, well, uh, for uh, creating this document, we have developed a, a, a participatory process uh, that we started in, to, in 2020, two years ago, in April of 2020, uh, and about around uh, during that year, we were updating all the information with the scientific se sector uh, to create a, a scientific tool first. And the first draft that we have uh, in the final 2021 uh, was uh, confronted and was validated in two workshops with the scientific center again and all the regional and, and administrations related with the management of Posidonia Oceanica. Uh, the first one was in November 2021. The last one with the administration was in January, two months ago, more or less. And we are finishing now this, this week, uh, these weeks, uh, the, the last final dra uh, draft of the document that will be elevated to the Wildlife Committee, that it's a, a legal structure here in Spain to validate all that kind of documents like uh, strategies, uh, consultation for species and something like that. In parallel, we are starting now from the ministry to create the, the, the strategy to apply the next generation funds related to removing uh, illegal anchoring. And uh, it's been um, evaluating, they are evaluating to create a royal decree to protect the Posidonia Midos in a, in a statal level because now it's, they are protected by uh, Natura 2000 sites and, uh, of course, uh, regional governments and their legislation, but not on a national uh, level, and they are creating a new legislation that will be super coordinated with that document of guidelines. Uh, in material of governance, we we'll have uh, three possibilities to create uh, a system of governance for applying the document of guidelines and probably the royal decree that I was uh, talking before. Uh, I don't explain, I will not explain all the alternatives, but uh, probably the first one, I don't know, my, my mouse, but uh, the first one will be, the, the probably will, will be a title here in Spain, creating a permanent Manifanerogam working group, which will be uh, uh, supported by a scientific advisory panel and will be implementing all the strategies to create uh, restoration strategies, uh, choosing the, the most effective techniques in its uh, site, and that's all. Uh, thank you again for, for inviting us. And if you have any questions, then I'll be here for me. Again. Grazie mille. Thank you, Maria, for your intervention. Now, let's continue with blue carbon topic. And please. Maria del Mar Rotero. Thank you. Thank you, Maria del Mar Rotero. Is from Life Blue Natura. 
Good afternoon. So, what about the project of blue carbon in order to face today's challenges and to face climate change, especially linked to biodiversity? Thank you very much. And, um, uh, thank you. Hello again. So I'm going to yes, gonna present one of the projects that we are working on. Uh, we have been working on because this project actually have finalized. And I'm going to try to share my screen uh, full on for everybody. Uh, just a second. Sí, sí. So I think you understand, you can see it now. Yes? Sí. Yes. The, the project that I'm going to talk about is, um, is the Live Blue Natura. And it's a project uh, coordinated by the regional government in the south of Spain uh, with funds from the EU, but also funds from a private company, private foundation, CEPSA. And also it has the different partners, including then the CSIC, which is a, a national research organization, a UCN, a NGO, and also the one of the regional state agencies for the implementation on, on monitoring aspects on the marine environment. So this project uh, is based on this concept. It's basically based on two ecosystems, what we call it the blue carbon ecosystems. Uh, Mm, sea grasses and coastal wetlands, and it's based uh, basically that the, this ecosystem has the capacity to help mitigate in climate change. Uh, they capture carbon uh, that is coming from the atmosphere into the with the photosynthesis and also in the sediments in the soil. So it's capturing in, in, in the soil on that, that you can see in the little diagram beside. Um, and they are very efficient, incredibly efficient on this storing capacity that they have. Um, just to put you some lines on this, um, in the left side, you can see, for example, different ecosystem, boreal forest, tropical forest, or Mediterranean forest in the storing capacity that they have on carbon. And other ecosystems like peatlands or storing mangroves, um, and the capacity that they have to store this carbon on the subsoil and above in the living biomass, whether they are the roots, also the, the green forest itself, the, the plants. But uh, what it makes unique to the blue carbon ecosystems is uh, what they are called uh, to mangrove, posido, uh, sea grasses in general, and soil marshes, is the capacity to store it underneath. Um, for example, in the case of Posidonia, that you can see the left uh, blue range on the, the that left uh, right sorry bar is incredible. The capacity that they have to uh, as a storage capacity, mostly on the soil. Ninety-eight percent of the carbon is stored in the soil of the of the plant. So we started the, you know, in, at the international level, we have been developing um, since, since years ago the Blue Carbon Initiative. That it was um, the aim was to reinforce that the ecosystem service that that the sea grasses were doing and other ecosystem like soil marshes and also mangroves were having, and developing there we have several meetings. Um, in one of these meetings, we brought it the attention in the Mediterranean as well, because the storing capacity of Posidonia. And on that time, we have also a regional project that was a life project, a Posidonia Oceanica life project in the region. And we decided to uh, start with the first ecosystem service analysis. And from there, it will come also the importance on, on these ecosystems. And we wanted to, with this, we started the next project that was uh, the Live Blue Natura project. But just to, before I go into jumping on this, I would like to say, for example, some few dates, a uh, few data that no analyze all this that I was putting there, but for example, that the organic carbon stored in Posidonia Oceanica alone is, uh, is huge, but this can be very different depending on the Posidonia. And these Posidonia meadows that can have very li limited capacity can be like 800 tons of carbon of CO2 per hectare, and other ones that have a huge capacity of carbon accumulated in this first meter of the soil. And also considering that 
the sum of this carbon accumulated, uh, it can be even up to eight meters underneath. Um, the, what it makes them unique is that the long-term capacity of this carbon to be there is not like um, it will be staying for decades, centuries, or even millennium, especially in Posidonia Oceanic as well. So versus other seagrasses in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, uh, the capacity is very big. Although other ecosystems like soil marshes also have a, a capacity to sequestrate, which is the, the amount that the carbon they assimilate per year per hectare. And also they have quite a bit of information on this and they are, they are quite important. So as we are losing this, uh, these sea grasses for the different pressures that we saw today, uh, we are losing the capacity of these ones, of this ecosystem to, to store carbon, to, and to maybe even emit carbon uh, back to the atmosphere. And that is what we wanted to, to reduce. So the Blue Carbon Project started in there, in, the, in Andalusia with this. It was the first pioneer project on blue carbon in the Europe. And it was started in 2015, 16. And the specific objective was to first to get a better understanding of the carbon sink capacities in the region as well as to give a, a characterization of how this works on both ecosystems and to, to use this, the tools that they are in the in financial carbon markets for uh, protecting this capacity, protecting these ecosystems, to conserve them and to help in the restoration processes as well. So going to a little bit more into detail, this is a little bit the specific objectives there. I don't know why this doesn't go, but um, sorry. The specific objectives were uh, to looking at uh, both soil marshes in two specific areas and the seagrasses, getting quantified the carbon deposits and the evolution of this, the fixation, the sequestration that this ecosystem has in the whole, in the whole region. And from this, also looking at the different conditions, how this was coming, and developing the policies and the financial mechanisms that can help for creating financing uh, possibilities for, for blue carbon. And we did this with the opportunity that we have, because we have a regional climate change law that uh, were on time, just on time, we were there, to introduce also the offsetting mechanism. I will explain a little bit more about the offsetting mechanism, but it's about the compensation mechanisms for uh, for greenhouse emission uh, volunteer greenhouse emission compensation for the carbon markets. Okay, so so the the work uh, uh, collect a huge amount of information over this time. This is one of the maps. On the carbon, we have more than 7,000 uh, soil samples, uh, more than 160 cores in different situations. The researchers were working really, really well to provide how much megatons of CO2 were at the moment in the region stored underneath of these uh, ecosystems. And uh, we come up with some, uh, some ideas on, on this, like for example, 60% of the carbon that is, is stored underneath of there could be uh, the year emissions from the region uh, in, in one year only, you know, so it was important storing capacity. And we also realized that in seagrasses, ecosystem, everything, most of it, 95% of them was in Posidonia Oceanica Meadows. And the, the, the degradation of this ecosystem will be releasing this kind of carbon as well. So the carbon markets and the carbon was working and trying to define what we call it the blue carbon projects. I just will very simplify to give you a context of what a blue carbon project is. Is you have a, a emission that can be a company that is trying to is making uh, reducing emission efforts, trying to grasp how much greenhouse emission they are producing, and after they trying to mitigate as much as possible, they can volunteer compensate. This also by actions on the on the ground, and that can be on forest or could be on the coastal ecosystems like uh, blue carbon habitats ecosystem. So in there is where we are trying to 
built is about the protection, the avoiding of the emission by helping the restoring of the habitats as well, or the creation of uh, expanding the, the ecosystem as well and the habitat itself. And the creating mechanism was on this. So the project was working along the, this, this time with uh, expert groups of participants that came from many different grounds. And we managed with them the discussing about how to do these blue carbon projects now and in the future for the Mediterranean and for Europe as well, with this very broad context, because we needed to set up the ground on how this should be, what should be the safeguarding principles all, for all these projects in the future that could be developed regarding social and governance that we work so much in the, and you were talking so much this morning, the environmental aspects of it, the procedural aspects of it, because offsetting, offsetting projects have to have a very robust mechanism behind as well to be reliable on what they are achieving, but also reliable in what biodiversity outcomes also will bring as well. And also stakeholder engagement as well and some other things like uh, the replicability or the verificability of them. So without getting into the complexity of what the, the offsetting mechanism is, but it's basically bringing from each offset, a thing credit to be represented by a ton of CO2 that has been reduced. So a credit is produced based on something that a project implement in other sites. And from this is how the carbon credits system work. And we have many different actions on these carbon markets. They are at the moment today, they are international carbon markets, uh, volunteer carbon markets as well, uh, and the standard carbon markets under the climate change uh, and the Paris Agreement, of course, but on the, on the coastal ecosystems, no? And also what we were trying to develop, it was the, the, the one for the region as well, addressed to, to, the, to the demands and the needs that we have and the information that we have from our ecosystems as well. But basically it was about to finance conservation and restoration efforts through this compensation system. As a pioneer project, it has a lot of investigation, a lot of discussions that you can imagine. So one of the words that we did also was um, develop different situations and according to these situations evaluate how the, the, uh, the system should be working, how the, the standard that are following this should verify what will be the most beneficial options regarding ecosystems but also regarding economics as well to make it reliable in the future as well. And this is the question, for example, that one of the study sites that we did in an area impacted by uh, anchoring and creating what you, it's obvious to see in there. And other ones we did it in seagrasses, for example, as well. And we're looking at different preserve, the great habitats and so forth to understand the carbon credits that could be generated in different situations. Um, from this also, we have to develop also a, a part on the management plan, on the feasibility actions that have to be done in the area, and, and how to go to the technicality of restoration, but also maybe some actions that are regarding passive restoration that sometimes is equally or more important to, to help the restoration of the system as well even also regulations that need to be put in there and so on, but also the ones that you already mentioned this morning, installation of ecological moorings, replanting, and so forth. And looking at the, all the different situations. Within the carbon markets context, you also have to see other things like uh, the permanent yeah. Abbiamo um, un problema con il collegamento. Un problema tecnico. Oh, sì. Bene. Bene, non so se riusciremo a recuperare dopo. E intanto andiamo a. Ripristiniamo, andiamo a. We have a problem, we can't hear you anymore. Thank you, Maria Del Mar Rotero. Thank you for your intervention. We really hope to um, listen to you again. We have Silvia Maltese here of Live Sea Forest. What are the methods that you used for Live Sea Forest for this program? 
Non no. lo so. Sì. The microphone is number five. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Yes, the project of Sea Forest is a life project. project. Um, and this is fundamental for the mitigation of the climate um, changes. As we saw in the other presentation, the Fanerogerum uh, meadows of Posidonia Oceanica are blue carbon ecosystems. And what is this blue carbon? The carbon that um, 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 the carbon stored in the coastal and marine ecosystems. And this means that the uh, Posidonia Oceanica meadows can help us uh, to offset the um, effects of the climate change, in particular in the project Sea Forest Life. We tried to quantify this car blue carbon in how? Well, we used um, um, indir indirect assessment. First of all, we can see here in this slide, here, okay, here, thank you. The first problem of the um, Poseidon Oceanica Meadows, as you can see here in this picture, is the anthropic impact. Uh, and we saw that the anchoring of the bores uh, create uh, huge damages to these uh, meadows. Uh, thanks to satellite uh, pictures, uh, we estimated uh, the um, investigated areas, uh, what were um, the areas that had the impact of the boards. Uh, so we saw the density of the anchoring in Poseidon Oceanica uh, meadows, and we saw in some pictures uh, that it's quite a strong impact that the boards can have. Uh, this is due to the fact that when uh, an anchor is uh, um, put in the seabed on the um, uh, meadows uh, with the movement of the anchor and uh, when it's used and uh, trolled the seabed can be damaged but moving on to the methodologies that we used we had an indirect estimation in fact the biomass biomass that is uh, used to estimate the blue carbon in the meadows uh, can be calculated uh, with uh, some um, bundles uh, and in this way we can assess the biomass that is used. In this case we use a zero emission surface vehicle um, that doesn't have an impact that um, uh, did some acoustic that has acoustic sensors. Uh, then we will see this in the video that is much more efficient. Uh, among these, we um, reached to do photogrammetic survey, and thanks to the the surveys, we had the creation of a rigid reference structure and the biomass of the meadow that we could convert into carbon. So we actually know the quantity of carbon that is in the meadows. There was a video here. Can we see it? I think that we have it, so we can then talk about it and see how it works. No, we don't have the video. OK, so it's OK. But as I said, we have uh, bisonic acoustic sensors. And then we had an indirect um, estimation and assessment. And then 
we, uh, thanks to the university in Turkey, we studied the sensors and we studied the um, assessments with the samples that we gathered uh, thanks to the support of the um, Calabria University spin-off. Uh, I know that maybe you have seen uh, during the break uh, that bicycle that was at the corner and that bicycle was used to um, to do this uh, investigation and with an indirect um, estimation we gathered the figures as i said uh, as the other presentations uh, mentioned the project c forest life will create a new market of carbon credit that is a financial um, project that represents the carbon that we, through the project actions, uh, managed to um, avoid through the installations of moorings fields. And uh, they will be uh, available for other people and they will buy these carbon uh, credits. Um, well, thank you. This is very interesting. Now your colleagues, uh, Bonamano, will talk about uh, this, right? Yes, here he is. Thank you, Silvia Maltese. Simone, can you hear us? We can see you, but maybe maybe your microphone is muted. But you are actually talking. Okay, here I am. Good evening. Uh, I'll share my screen here. Okay, the project Invest uh, Forest Life, as we said before, has the uh, aim to estimate the OC CO2 fixed and emitted by Poseidonia Oceanica using this invest model, and um, that is uh, crucial, the invest model. This uh, model was uh, developed by Stanford University and it's based on the analysis of the um, accumulation, emission and sequestration of CO2 in the atmosphere of Poseidonia Oceanica Meadow. It does it using three, um, three steps in the biomass in the negromass and in the sediment. The negromass is the banquette, while the sediment, as we said before, has the most part of the carbonic, the organic carbon. But how does this uh, uh, model work? Um, it has three steps. In the first part, we have the maps and the distribution LULC, and they are three different kinds of Posidonia. These kinds are very important. I'm sorry, Simone, but uh, um, can you stick to the microphone, please? We can't hear you. I'm sorry, 
I can't listen to you. Sorry, we don't have time, so if we can solve the problem, we can move on with the next intervention. Sorry, the enthusiasm of telling about, talk about the project is uh, huge. Um, so, but we are, are um, sad, but we can't follow with your intervention. Okay, I'm here, I'm back. Uh, I can't talk and at the same time listen to translation, so please, you can take this off. Okay. Sì, grazie. Allora, praticamente ecco, il modello permette quindi di calcolare... Interpreters are very sorry, but due to technical reasons, there is no possibility to translate the following intervention. Thank you for your patience. We have seen it as being compressed between 3 and 9,35 tons of CO2 per year, which is equivalent to an interval of 71 to 130 grams of carbon per meter squared, which are in line with the values reported in the bibliography. E abbiamo poi eh, fatto una, eh, ricostruito uno scenario di degrado e eh, il, il progetto in termini di scenario di degrado considera le, gli ancoraggi dalle imbarcazioni da diporto e abbiamo ipotizzato che eh, laddove c'è una maggiore concentrazione di imbarcazioni da diporto eh, c'è anche un passaggio da posidonia oceanica su sabbia, quindi in buono stato, a una posidonia oceanica degradata e questo in eh, 20 anni. Quindi abbiamo applicato questo tipo di assunzione per ricavare le emissioni di CO2, eh, una prima de stima delle emissioni di CO2 nelle aree di progetto. Abbiamo visto che nella zona di Castellabate eh, l'emissione è pari a 800 tonnellate di CO2 l'anno. E la zona di, ehm, di eh, infreschi è pari a 125 tonnellate di CO2 l'anno, mentre nelle zone della Sardegna, in particolare nella Sinara, l'emissione è di circa 350 tonnellate di CO2 l'anno e nella zona della Maddalena è di 900 tonnellate di CO2 l'anno. L'ultimo step del progetto è quello poi di valutare le mancate perdite di CO2 dovute proprio all'installazione di buoi ecosostenibili ad una migliore gestione degli ormeggi che eh, diciamo, favorisce l'ancoraggio nelle zone eh, dove non c'è posidonia oceanica e soprattutto in piccola parte all'utilizzo di ricucitute, quindi dei piccoli rimpianti sperimentali che verranno e sono stati effettuati tenendo conto delle linee guida del progetto se posso. Quindi l'accumulo di CO2 generata nelle azioni del progetto viene utilizzata all'interno di un mercato di scambi volontari dei crediti per carbonio, in analogia a quanto abbiamo sentito prima nel caso del progetto Blu Natura, che saranno poi venduti ad aziende per compensare le emissioni de derivanti appunto dalle loro attività. Grazie per l'attenzione e mi scuso insomma, per uh, l'inconveniente tecnico. Grazie signora. Grazie, Grazie a lei, Grazie. buona mano di Seaforest Life. Barbara, adesso abbiamo un collegamento sì, importante. Abbiamo, sì, abbiamo un collegamento importante e a cui dobbiamo dare necessariamente la precedenza. Now we are going to listen to a very important intervention because Jonathan Parkin will uh, intervene from the European Commission of uh, Environmental Issues and he's going to tell us a very important uh, aspect in connection with uh, environmental measures and he will explain the importance of uh, live projects Jonathan, could you speak in Italian or in English? Of course, you understand Italian. Is everything okay? Okay, benissimo. Allora, posso continuare? <laughs> Va benissimo, ma mi hanno chiesto di parlare in italiano, allora lo faccio in italiano. <ride> ehm, ancora alla Commissione Europea, a DG Ambiente, a Bruxelles, su, um, sono proprio seguo l'Italia e um, Danimarca in questo momento per um, il semestre europeo, per um, il fondo coesione e politica di coesione 
ma anche una cosa molto importante che dove vorrei focalizzare il mio intervento è il cosiddetto Environmental Implementation Review che si traduce in italiano come il riesame dell'attuazione della politica ambientale. Allora, quest'ultimo è stato già pubblicato in uh, 17 e 19 e stiamo per pubblicare la terza edizione adesso in settembre di, uh, di quest'anno, proprio in, uh, al momento quando il Presidente Ursula von der Leyen farà la sua State of the Union Address. Allora, questo aeroporto è proprio un photosnap, se volete, della dove siamo sull'attuazione, sull'implementazione di tutta la nostra acquis communautaire, tutte le nostre regole che cambiamo in Europa, sia in campo dell'area di rifiuti, acqua, ma anche nell'ambiente ambiente marino, che è la vostra interessa oggi. Però anche abbiamo un capitolo in questo rapporto proprio sulla, sulla biodiversità, sulla Natura 2000. Allora, per esempio, se prendiamo l'Italia come esempio, si sa che per um, ambienti terrestri l'Italia protegge più o meno 21,3% del suo territorio, invece per dell'ambiente marina è solo 2% che è molto sotto quella media europea di 12% e ancora più sotto quell'obiettivo per il 2030 di 30%. Allora, cioè, vediamo, 30 con 2, c'è cioè una grossa differenza. Questo è un esempio per l'Italia perché penso che ehm, questo vi interessa di più. Ehm, poi anche in questo rapporto abbiamo un altro capitolo sull'ambiente marino, dove per esempio guardiamo la um, direttiva Marine Spatial Framework Directive e l'articolo 8 e 9, dove guardiamo tutti i descriptori e descriptor, i descriptors dello stato della, um, dell'ambiente marino e per esempio per l'Italia possiamo vedere c'è un po' di problemi con il scarso qualità per certi parametri. E in questo contesto eh, sono molto interessato del vostro progetto Seposo sulla Possedonia Oceanica. Addirittura conosco anche personalmente molto bene Piombino, è eh, una zona lì, eh, conosco il vostro intervento perché frequento quella costa da molti anni, eh, ma anche altre zone dell'Italia. E, allora è molto è importante questo collegamento fra il progetto LIFE, questo progetto Seposo, e diciamo il quadro più, più grande. E in questo contesto sappiamo bene che il Piano Nazionale per la Resilienza e il Recupero, il PNNR, per l'Italia è previsto per 2025 il restauro di 22 siti e habitat marine, cioè si vede che il vostro progetto è proprio al posto giusto, al momento giusto. Questo è per l'Italia, dove questo è stato previsto perché l'Italia ha 191 miliardi di euro per questa PNRR, è molto più grande del, in, in tutta Europa, anche in Spagna c'è più o meno 70 miliardi di euro, ma l'Italia ha deciso anche di fare il ricorso non solo a sovvenzioni, ma anche di prestiti, che è abbastanza eh, meritevole in questo rispetto. E, però anche su tutti questi soldi noi abbiamo fatto un calcolo che l'Italia manca sempre per l'ambiente, più o meno dovrebbe investire ehm, 0.3 della PIL, in più, in più per la protezione ambientale. Già l'Italia spende, abbiamo fatto questa stima, 0,69 del PIL per la protezione ambientale, però non è sufficiente per tutti i bisogni, sto parlando non solo dell'ambiente marino, ma anche dei rifiuti di acqua, di aria. L'Italia, per esempio, 
Um, purtroppo è già stato sancionato dalle corti di giustizia europeo per la mancanza dell'implementazione per i rifiuti e anche per l'acqua di deparazione che anche addirittura ha un impatto anche sull'ambiente marina e anche per il problema dell'aria nel bacino, um, bacino del, del Po dove c'è anche un altro progetto molto importante di LIFE che siamo, si chiama Prepare. Allora, la mia intervento oggi è proprio non è perché io non sono nel vostro, nel vostro mondo di scientifica, io sto parlando in modo più generale, ehm, diciamo da Bruxelles, proprio sul nostro, la cosa, il lavoro che stiamo facendo con queste Environmental Implementation Review. Ma sono molto interessato dopo, cioè quando pubblichiamo alla fine di quest'anno, anche l'anno prossimo, di collaborare molto di più attraverso il Ministero della Transizione Ecologica che non lo so se sì, sono presente, ma già con ISPRA sto lavorando in um, collaborazione per serie di seminari che abbiamo fatto con CINSEDO, che la, proprio fa parte della um, conferenza Stato-Regione a Roma, em, a Parigi, a Roma, em, dove abbiamo portato tutti i regioni insieme e abbiamo già discusso acqua, rifiuti, e aria, ma non vedo perché non possiamo fare un seminario se c'è proprio la volontà della regione Ispra, Mite e altri um, stakeholders di fare un seminario su questo su questa tema. Io mi fermo là, vorrei ringraziarvi eh, Life Seposo per questo invito e vi auguro una, um, un buon fine di lavoro oggi. Grazie. Grazie mille per il suo intervento, grazie a Jonathan Parker. Grazie, davvero. Thank you, Jonathan Parker, thank you for your intervention. Very useful. Especially thinking about, uh, thinking about what we have said during this morning and now. So let's continue with the last part of our meeting. We are going to speak about citizen science and environmental information in the so-called citizen science. We know that the citizens have the main role in order to share information with scientists as well. So, for GRIPAM and POSME BED 2, Loredana Mulas is going to tell us their work because uh, Laura Santona, uh, unfortunately, couldn't be here. So now we are going to share the presentation. Please. OK, we're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for your invitation. This intervention is linked to examples of communication, awareness raising and dissemination tools developed within POSBIMAT2 and European project. Yeah, we're saying that this project is to foster communication, awareness and dissemination especially in the framework of these two projects, POSMA 2 and Jiripan, organized by Sardinia region. POSMA 2 is organized by, by the Interreg MED and is organized in the Mediterranean beaches. At the same time, Jiripan organized uh, ecological networks, especially we work on uh, integrated management of these uh, ecological networks to past and marine areas. I'm not going to tell you every details, but of course I can say that in uh, during, during the years in these projects we organized some activities to share information and to share a common information, a shared one. 
the goal was to reach our stakeholders with our survey and studies. And for the reason, here we are. For the reason, our materials were based on three different uh, keys. Before explain my examples, I would like to emphasize that the success of this activity was caused by an involvement and engagement of local stakeholders, especially local stakeholders, but we could speak about uh, several levels. And we involve uh, uh, public administration, marine organizations, tourists as well, hotels, uh, enterprises, in order to create a shared document. So we organize activities to increase the knowledge, capacity and trust, and the capacity building as well. This led to fewer conflicts, because if you can explain the role and the importance of uh, what is considered a seaweed, in this case, you can uh, increase the awareness of pollution. Now, in order to briefly explain my project, I would like to present you some examples in the framework of Juripama project. The first is for several decision makers and we realized, well, the Office of um, Environment uh, of Corsic realized a um, video, very interesting video. It's a four minute video. I would like to at least share one video, one minute video, just the first one mi minute. Nella parte centrale, forse. La Posidonie forme de vastes herbiers sous-marins visibles depuis l'espace. Elle est l'une des rares plantes à fleurs à avoir colonisé le monde marin. Ces formations végétales sont âgées de plus de 100 000 ans. C'est l'un des organismes vivants les plus vieux de notre planète. La Posidonie oxygène l'eau, stabilise les plages. Véritable puits de carbone, elle est également un refuge pour la faune marine. C'est pourquoi, depuis plus de 30 ans, elle est protégée par la loi. Sa destruction est interdite. Pourtant, elle reste encore aujourd'hui menacée. <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry because we stopped the video doing the best part. After, okay, could you share the video? In the meantime, we are going to explain our slides, our presentation. Please, just, just 30 seconds more to understand the impact of this phenomenon. Okay, so which was the importance of this video? It improved the awareness and the process of knowledge in connection with anchorage uh, uh, damage. This was a perfect contribution to realize a decision between 2019 and 2020. And with this law, we, uh, the government established 
uh, regulation of Anchorage uh, uh, impact. And that's a very good example of communication activity, especially when people are not aware of the topic. Okay, so let's uh, stop the video to share again the presentation. There's another video, the post-media 2 video, because in this framework, among the several stakeholders, we can find a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting participant. Please stop the video just a moment. Thank you. As I was saying, on this occasion, we analyzed just a few tools we used. In particular, this tool it's, is for young people, for teenagers, because our idea was to involve young people that could bring to their family uh, in the message of Posidonia, and the message was the importance of conservation of Posidonia in the beaches. Why? Because we created a title, Posidonia Team, to let young people feel the main character of this story in order to let them believe in this uh, goal. We realized, uh, we realized um, web series and this production tells about the negative perception of Poseidon Oceanica, but uh, the change of view when people discover what Poseidon Oceanica is. And we supported this uh, initiative with T-shirt, with local uh, uh, territory, for example, Capogallo Urbanare, and so on. After we translated the video into English and uh, shared it with uh, other bodies. Okay, let's uh, uh, watch the video. Thank you. <laughs> Maledette alghe, non ho visto lo scoglio. Alghe? Sono piante e hanno un nome, un bellissimo nome. Posidonia, dal dio greco del mare Poseidone. Ragazzo mio, hai scatenato l'inferno. Va a vedere qua, è solo un graffio. Vado a prendere il disinfettante. Alghe, piante, che differenza fa? Per me è solo l'erbaccia che ha nascosto lo scoglio. C'è come una bella differenza? La Posidonia Oceani, che è una fanerogama marina endemica del Mediterraneo, una pianta con radici, fusto, foglie e fiori, e come tutte le piante in autunno, perde le foglie. Sono le mareggiate le correnti a depositarle in spiaggia, formando le banchette, questi mucchi che vedi qui. A me sembra alligo. Comunque io mi chiamo Emanuele. E tu, Gretina? Non è un rifiuto. Marina, slega gli lisci. Ah, ecco, Marina. Ah, fa male. Cioè, è per la tavola. Fa male che si sia rotta. Ma no, sono solo graffi. Era la mia preferita, non potrò usarla per la gara. Ha bevuto solo un po' d'acqua salata. Ma tranquillo, te la giusto io. Bellissimo. Thank you. It was very beautiful. And you have 12 chapters more. Yeah, of course. Please watch it. Watch them on YouTube. It's a very interesting uh, production. So, speaking about citizen science in Greece, you know that in Cyclades Posidonia, Polizone is very important, so 
Please, the, the floor is yours. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay. for uh, inviting can, us here. Okay. Yes. So I'm Up in uh, the sky. Okay. representing the Cycladis Preservation Fund. Um, oh, I can do it for you. Yes, please. Oh, too, too much. No. This is the first one? Yes, but uh, okay. it's a little okay. I'll try again to be faster. Okay, okay, so okay. we are a small fund. We are a non-civil non-profit. We're a civil non-profit enterprise in Greece. And what we do in general is that we raise funds from private entities and companies, and we give these funds out to grants to the Cycladis to civil society initiatives. So this project that I'm going to briefly talk about, the Cycladis Posidonia Alert, is kind of different because we saw this... Um... Okay, can I do it with that? No. Okay. So we saw this uh, blank in the Cycladis. We have the Posidonia medios that are not regulated in terms of uh, anchoring regime. They're only regulating in terms of not allowing trawlers to specific depths for fishing. And at the same time, we saw an interest by the locals to do something about it, but they were lacking capacity. So we spoke with the Hellenic Center for Marine Research that probably all of you know. And we discussed what we can do with our small powers as a small fund to work together in a complementary way to other things happening in Greece and nothing currently happening in the cyclades but being planned. Let's hope that some funding will arrive for that. And we decided to engage into a citizen science approach. On one hand, to gather data about the existence of Posidonia on certain coasts around specific cyclades islands. And at the same time, through this um, citizen science component, where we ask people to fill in certain questionnaires about the presence of Posidonia and anchoring from tourist boats on specific gulfs, we actually engage them because we invite them to events, we talk to them about Posidonia, and we're already seeing that they're very surprised to know that they shouldn't be anchoring on Posidonia. So they have the opportunity to anchor elsewhere, Posidonia is not extremely dense on the small islands that we're talking about. And this is the first already positive, um, positive um, message for us, that even with small powers and with doing complementary measures, we can somehow prepare the communities for the legislation that we hope eventually will come. Because even when legislation is there, that does not mean that the, that the skipper will abide by it, or the yacht owner will abide by it, or the daily trip uh, cruiser. So for us, it's really important to combine the data collection that the HCMR also compares with satellite images, and there will be some diving involved. And in the end of the day, we wish to find those locations that are primary goals to install some pilot uh, mooring buoys to avoid anchoring altogether. For this, we have to work with the public, <laughs> so <laughs> it all gets quite complex. But we are working for this to sort of show the way for others and build some steps for something larger to come. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Really interesting. And to underline the collaboration with the citizens and the scientific organisms or other entities. Thank you, thank you. Benissimo, se dovessimo uh, pensare... Perfect. No. If we were to think in Italy as a huge uh, tank of sea users, as potential uh, citizens, with who to do certain science, I can think how many members does the Italian Naval League have. Oh, sorry, the first m microphone is doesn't work. I don't know why. Okay, now you can hear you. Welcome, welcome back. Thank you for participating. Oh, thank you, thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your patience. Of course, 
Italian Naval League is a very important association with a lot of members, more than 50 million members. And we are a non-profit association. The Naval League is present in the entire country. We have 50 delegation and three nautical center. In during the summer, teenagers have the possibility to experience this particular habitat. They have uh, experiences with uh, the sea. They can uh, participate in lessons where they learn other things about marine habitats. Uh, one of these topics is a uh, Posidonia Oceanica topic, and when we tell them that that's not a seaweed, that's a plant, a seagrass, they are always uh, surprised. And in general, we could say that this project we are uh, carrying on with ISPRA is very important for for our members that are more than 50,000. These members usually live in uh, uh, marine habitat. They usually go to the beach, the sea in January, in February, and so on. They use boats. And we already received uh, uh, materials from them of this project, because this project started in September with the first stage this is the formation uh, step, formation, our members' formation, and they are young people and members of uh, our in National League, more experienced members. Now, in the second step, we've started the, anal um, the analysis of uh, the territory. And for the reason, we started analyzing and uh, monitoring Posidonia Oceanica. With uh, um, litter we have found in our beaches and our um, seas. For the reason, we use a monitoring scheme. And what we found, leaves, uh, flowers, fruits, Today we have no results, not yet at least, but we've already received um, pictures that you can see uh, in the slide that show Posidonia Oceanica fruits. So in during this period we are going to analyze these uh, fruits and we are going to monitor, monitor the results we obtained in order to understand the um, conditions of our plantations. Let's hope that uh, our work will Im be improved. Thank you for your patience and for your attention. I, very, I presented my work very briefly. OK, so let's end with ISPRA. Giordana De Vendictis, good afternoon, of Science Together Doc Net. Yeah, sorry, Science Together Net. We are a network of university and uh, um, centers of research, and we work together. We collaborated with uh, ISPRA scientists, the uh, Sapienza University, Torregato University, um, National, Cent National Center of Re Research, uh, Universidad de la Tuscia, uh, University of Nettuno. We are 11 members to share this uh, awareness, scientific awareness. But actually, we work in uh, a lot of cities in Italy. We have been working on this project uh, from 2004, we received a European fund 
the last Monday of September uh, we meet of um, we participate with 450 uh, cities of Europe we won this project and for this reason we are going to organize the meeting in the next September what's our goal it's to connect our citizens to research the European Commission asks us to create effective and concrete results on daily life and on concrete daily life. So what's the results of European projects and what's the impact on people's life? So we connect students, uh, children, families and so on. How? We let them get inside into the laboratory, showing them how researchers uh, work. And on the opposite, we bring scientists to museums, uh, associations. We organize uh, meeting and uh, informal meetings. Last year, we organized 30 in three months. We um, 11 partners, but of course, ISPRA works very good in this way because we have a lot of uh, researchers that uh, love collaborating and organizing meetings. Last year, we went to Torre Falavia Macchia Donda. I can't say every place because we organized. Uh, we had a lot of meetings, even in uh, our city. So, is there any reply, an answer? Is it strong? Is there a um, surprise or not? Yes, of course, we can see the surprise of participants, but of course, we... As, we see interest as well because they call the, uh, their children, they call um, families, and they bring friends, and that's the best thing for us because the impact is positive. Furthermore, I had to admit that it's very important the uh, engagement of uh, researchers that love researching. And I think that that could be considered an added value for this project. Because they organized a network in this very important level. So this is the core of our project. So if I can finish, if I can conclude, the European Commission asked two goals more. The formation of researchers. So we organized a workshop with uh, researchers, uh, with uh, journalists, a very important uh, Italian journalist, to teach them the communication techniques. And I think that it was very interesting. And we had to organize Affirmation for, for journalists. So we organized this uh, workshop last year, in particular with journalists that uh, um, are, that usually work on environment to create a connection between research and journalism. I had to say that I participated in this uh, workshop and it was amazing because we usually work or research, and I understood that sometimes we are not able to transmit a message. So I discovered that's a technique, and we have to learn it. Thank you, because you perfectly conclude this evening with uh, communication and results, because you share this message. People are very interested. Do you agree? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that we faced 
every aspects. Yes, we spoke about four years work. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. And we would like to say goodbye with a take-home messages. These are four fundamental messages that transplantation is a solution to help restore damage or regress in Posidonia Oceanica meadows, but only if done effectively and sustainably. Uh, this is not easy, as we saw. So we need a detailed planning uh, to achieve a good result. Uh, of course, we let you understand uh, that there are two fundamental aspects here to guarantee uh, good uh, transplantation, the good practices, and a good governance. And you have seen how difficult it is to reach a good governance. But difficult doesn't mean uh, impossible. The most important thing is to have the tools. Uh, then we also saw the importance uh, of acts in a proper way with the uh, good means, with the good words, words and this is not uh, something easy. But we have to do this because uh, citizens really want to know the information and we know that there are people that want to know. This is why the means should be always the proper one, and uh, we have to reach the good target. Um, so, well, um, in conclusion, we only we see that only the adoption adoption of good practices and a constant synergy between scientific research, uh, government actions, and the conscious participation of citizens can truly guarantee the protection and the recovery of marine. Um, habitat, habitants and all the colleagues that came here and that participated showed uh, it to us uh, and they showed what we can do for the other marine habitats as a future commitment for the national plan in our country and in the um, European Union. So for all the next generation, for all the kids, that we uh, talked before talked before thank you it was a great pleasure for us to talk about this project and uh, um, thank you for um, being here it was wonderful thank you